somebody's wrong. Either the Bible is wrong or the textbooks are wrong about the earth being, you know, hot molten mass. So what is the evidence? What's the truth about this? One of the neatest books on this topic is this one we referred to earlier by Robert Gentry called Creation's Tiny Mystery. He spent years studying radio polonium halos, which are little tiny rings. They are only visible with a microscope. And they're found in granites. Every type of granite all over the world contains these little radio polonium halos, little tiny circles in the rock. Well, what are they? Well, polonium is one of the many elements on the periodic table. As polonium decays, it's radioactive, it's dropping to another level, it sends off little fragments, kind of like a hand grenade. The problem is polonium has a really, really short half-life, like 164 thousandths of a second. So if this was taking place in hot molten rock, it would decay, the polonium would decay, poof, make its little halo, and the rock is liquid, so it would disappear, it would flow away. Just like the fireworks from the 4th of July don't stay there in the sky all year. It goes up, poof, makes a little ring, and then falls down. But if you could explode a hand grenade in a giant block of jello, the fragments would go out and stick and be preserved. The only way you could preserve a ring, a halo, would be to do it in something that is, you know, like a giant block of jello or in a already, something already solid. The way to get these little polonium halos preserved, which are found all over the world, is to do it while the rock is already solid. Robert Gentry was writing all kinds of articles about this radio polonium halo saying, look, you know, this indicates the earth was never hot molten rock. And granite is an interesting rock. I don't think anybody knows for sure how granite formed. If you melt granite and then let it cool down, it does not turn back to granite. It turns to rhyolite. You can see a picture of rhyolite here. So all the granites have these polonium halos. What does that mean? Apparently granite was the original created foundation stone. That was the original created rock. It's the only way to get these little halos in there that I know. You can talk to Robert Gentry. His website is halos.com and get much more of the technical information on this. So I think the evidence would point to the fact the earth was never hot molten rock. And then, uh, Nova TV program, they ran an article in the summer of 05, they said, Oxygen-18 found in 4.4 billion year old zircons show it had contact with large quantities of water. Why don't they get it? If these little zircon crystals, which are extremely tiny, have evidence, show, show us that they had qu contact with large quantities of water, 4.4 billion years old, I don't buy that of course for a second, but their own evidence ought to show them the earth was never a hot molten mass. Never. Often in seminars I get asked the question, what about global warming? Is the earth really getting hotter? Well, I don't know. I've lived on it for 53 years now, but it's, to me it seems about the same as it's always been. But of course that's a short time frame compared to the big picture. According to the first Corinthians, it says the earth is the Lord's. God owns the world. He, Psalmist said, Psalm 8, when I consider the heavens, God made the heavens, and thou, he made man to have dominion over them. Our job is to be the, the tenant. God's the owner, he's the landlord, we're the tenant. Our job is to take care of his earth. It doesn't belong to us, but we're supposed to take care of it. It belongs to him. Now Karl Marx in his Communist Manifesto gave ten ways to destroy a, a capitalist country and turn it into a communist country. Number one was abolish private property. That was essential to destroy capitalism. Nobody's allowed to have private property. Well, if you read through the Bible, in Leviticus 25, <clears throat> it talks about in the 50th year, they have the year of Jubilee. You proclaim liberty throughout the land, and everybody returns to his possession. There's a good link here between liberty and having your own possessions. See, if you own it, you control it. So if God created the world, he owns it. He controls it, and he's let man use it for his glory. And there are those who don't like that idea, guys like Karl Marx and communists. They think, no, the world belongs to us, you know, and we control it. There is no God. But in 1 Kings, it talks about having your own vine, your own fig tree, drink water out of your own cistern, living, running waters out of your own well. Private property is essential to liberty. And Peter Burrell said, we reject the idea of private property. Kids in school today are having pledges like this. Talk about stupid. This kind of stuff's on the walls of many public schools. I pledge allegiance to the earth, which I do love and depend on, and to all life on land, air, and sea, which is as much a part of earth as me. This one says, I pledge allegiance to the world, to care for earth, sea, and air, to honor every living thing with peace and justice everywhere, 
Jacob Redstead told me a couple years ago, he said when he was in third grade in elementary school in Minnesota, his teacher, Miss Klopaki, took down the American flag and had the third graders pledge to the earth instead. Can you imagine? Boys and girls, we're going to pledge to the world today. We're starting these kids in third grade. Half the cartoons on Saturday morning TV now are that kind of way, you know. Destroy the mean old capitalists, you know, that are destroying the world and save the planet, you know, Captain Planet. There's all kinds of cartoons designed to get the kids thinking that, you know, we got to save the earth. Well, I am against pollution and I'm against destroying things unnecessarily, okay? But the real purpose of this environmental movement and the big scare about global warming is not to save the earth. The purpose is to establish communist plank number one, abolish private property. They want you to have to get a permit to cut down a tree on your own property. One guy in California had this tree was growing, obviously, into his house. And it was crushing the front porch. The house was a hundred and some years old. And it had been planted and the tree was growing and was caving in the front porch. So he went to get a permit to cut down the tree. And they said, you can't cut down the tree because, you know, the trees are protected. He said, well, then I need to get a permit to remodel my porch. They said, no, that's a house is a hundred years old. That's a historic building. You can't remodel the porch. <laughs> Talk about stupid. Why go ask for a permit at all? That's what starts the problem. But see, once people sign a contract to become a servant of whoever, now you're under, you're under contractual law. You know, if you sign a contract to become 501c3, well, then you better do everything they tell you to do. Okay? So don't sign the contract. Don't get yourself tangled up in those things. And that gets difficult to do. But there's a good book on the global warming question if you want to read more. It's called Facts, Not Fear. I'm sure it's available lots of places, but uh, Marilyn Quayle, Dan Quayle's wife, the former vice president, wrote the foreword to it. What is the real evidence <clears throat> about global warming? And you can take a look through that if you'd like. It's in our library or order your own if you'd like. They said in a, a magazine that man-made rainforest baffles scientists. They said a man-made rainforest that should have taken millennia to evolve has baffled scientists by springing up in just 150 years. This business of us destroying the planet and destroying these ancient rainforests and, you know, oh, we're going to ruin the world and the sky is falling is, I think, baloney. And there are a lot of environmentalists that are probably very sincere, very intelligent, and very wrong. And they're fighting the wrong battle. Now, it's true, people abuse the environment, and when somebody's dumping chemicals upstream from my house, you know, I'm going to sue them and say, don't dump that in my water supply, okay? That's fine. But if there's an environmental problem, is the government the one to fix it? Show me anything they fixed. If they fix it, it'll cost ten times more than it should. And probably still won't be right. I do believe in global warming, though. The Bible says in Revelation 16, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the power was given to him to scorch men with fire. There's going to be global warming. Hasn't happened yet. Coming soon to a city near you. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, I applied mine heart to know and search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things. I think it's wise for Christians especially to do that. Try to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason. And I think we could be more effective soul winners and more effective for God's kingdom if we knew more and could give an answer. That's the goal of all this of seminars that we produce is to equip people that can give an answer to know the truth. 1 Peter chapter 3 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that's in you. And we hope that this training you'll get here will give you the answers you need. 1 Timothy 2 says, study to show yourself approved unto God. We should study and learn, not just so we can give an answer to others, but so God is pleased with us. That's the goal of study. God, are you happy? One of the questions I often get as I speak at universities is, hey, Hoven, are you the only one that believes in creation? Don't all scientists believe in evolution? <laughs> Absolutely not. I don't know how that question even comes up. Not all scientists do not believe in evolution, number one. Okay, Thousands and thousands and thousands of them are creation scientists. For instance, uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys uh, worked for years at the Sandia National Laboratories. There's a good article about him on the Answers in Genesis website. They've got a whole list of 180 some or 200 uh, scientists today who are young earth Bible-believing six-day creationists. Dr. Uh, Humphreys said, um, using a simple statistical approach, I would conservatively estimate that in the United States alone there are around 10,000 practicing professional scientists who openly believe in six-day recent creation. So first, it's not true that all scientists believe in evolution. Secondly, even if they did, that's not how you establish truth. 
It doesn't matter what the majority believe. The majority has, has a long history of being wrong, okay? They used to teach, you know, all the planets go around the Earth. The majority was wrong, okay? Though, believe it or not, there still are some scientists who are geocentrists, who teach the Earth is in the center. And everything goes around the earth. And there's, I've got the books in the library. You can read those if you want to take that. Uh, I've looked at the sub subject. I just I can't buy it yet. I think they're wrong. I think the sun is in the center. There are the time when they used to teach that big rocks fall faster than little rocks. That was taught for 2,000 years, and it's wrong. So the majority can be wrong. They used to teach the doctrine of humors. You know, if you're sick, you have bad blood. Take out your blood, and you get better. That's how George Washington died. They were wrong. And in that case, they were dead wrong. Okay. Um, in John chapter 7, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, out of the house town of Bethlehem? Notice what happened here in John chapter 7. The people were arguing about, Was Jesus really the Christ? And some of them said, Wait, 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 Christ doesn't come out of Galilee, and Jesus came from Galilee. The problem is, they had a misconception. They thought Jesus came from Galilee. Where was Jesus actually born? Bethlehem. So they had the whole wrong problem. They're arguing about the wrong subject. So in John 3, 43, it says, So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him. They would have tried to kill the messenger. Because they had a wrong impression, they're going after this. We've got to shut this guy up. This Jesus is out there preaching, and we've got to shut him up. They got the wrong impression to start with, and that's what happens. People get the wrong idea. They think creationists like me are doing damage to education system. No, we're, we're the right people. We're trying to fix the problem, okay? We're trying to resolve it. Verse 45 says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have ye not brought him? Now this is classic. Notice, the chief priests sent their hoodlums to go get Jesus. Jesus answered their questions. They came back and said, Wow, never man spake like this man. And then the Pharisees said, well, you should have asked him this. I get this every time, including three days ago in uh, Michigan at the university up there. There's always some professor that says, you know, they, they advertise that Hovind's coming to the university to speak, Northern Uni Michigan University. Or the week before, it was in Wisconsin, at uh, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A hundred professors in Milwaukee refused to debate me. Eighty professors at Northern Michigan University refused to debate me. I've had close to 4,000 now professors that have refused to debate on the subject. And they don't even come when I speak. They send their students and say, here, ask him this, ask him this, ask him this. The student comes back and says, teacher, he answered all my questions. And then the teacher says, you idiot, you should have asked him this and this and this. Well, teacher, you coward, why didn't you come? Okay, <laughs> why didn't you ask the question? And professors do the same thing, just like the Pharisees did. The professors send their students to try to trap the creationists. They won't come themselves, okay? And then when they, that doesn't work, they try to use the law to silence them. Let's just pass a law that says you can't teach creation. Or if anybody does try to teach creation, we're going to get them fired. Send them out of here. Then verse 47. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Hovind translation. Are you stupid? Has this guy deceived you? Then they, this is the classic one they always use. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Translation. None of the other scientists believe this creation stuff. Therefore, evolution must be true. Now think about that logic. The majority believes this, therefore it's true. I mean, that's silly. First place, it's not true the majority believe it. Secondly, that's not how you tell. And then they said, But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Hovind translation. We have knowledge, you don't. We have a degree, you don't. We don't approve of your degree. It's from a non-accredited Christian school. Therefore, we're smart, you're dumb. That's a common tactic used by the professors today. And the, the 99 professors I've debated, it happens all the time. And in one of the guys, Nicodemus very wisely said, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him? Nicodemus at least had the common sense to say, Hey, before we judge this guy Jesus and say he's wrong, he's stupid, etc., let's listen to what he's saying. And I would encourage college students and professors and anybody, listen to the creation side. Just listen. Really honestly listen and hear it. And then make your decision. When I spoke in Soviet Union a couple years ago, I was at a university over there in... Uh, I don't know, Pavel, if you remember what city I was in. It's in Ukraine, your home state. But uh, one of the cities had a university. They shut down the university and sent 30 professors to have me speak for two hours. Because on creation. I was a big celebrity. You know, Dr. Hoven from all the way from Florida. You know, the further I travel, the more famous I am. You know, when I'm right here in town, it's not famous at all. But I was, they shut down the university and 30 professors came. After about an hour of speaking on creation, one of the professors was crying. And I asked the translator, uh, this girl named Olga, I said, what's he crying about? And she said, he's never heard the creation story. He didn't know there was one. 
And I think there's a lot of people in America, a lot of students that I see in America, have never really honestly heard the creation story. So, if somebody says, everybody else believes in evolution, therefore you should too, number one, that's not a good argument. And it's not true, okay? And listen to the creation side. Understand it. Because when I get done talking, a lot of times, like in the airplane, I sat by somebody who believed in evolution just last week. I said, well, let me just explain the creation side. It took three minutes, explained the creation view very simply. And they said, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah, just listen, okay, to what they, what they got to say. Okay, they started with the false assumption that Jesus was from Galilee. He wasn't, okay, he was actually born in Bethlehem. Some of the Pharisees had not believed him, so therefore that's proof that he's not right. You get the same thing today. Some scientists don't believe in creation, therefore creation is not true. That is absolutely stupid logic, okay? And has, they'll say, has he published in science journals? As if, well, you don't see creation articles in National Geographic, therefore that proves it's not right. Well, you didn't see many capitalist articles in communist journals 10 years ago either, by the way, you know. <laughs> it doesn't prove anything's right or wrong. The majority can be wrong. The majority followed Aaron into rebellion. The majority voted not to go into the Promised Land in Numbers chapter 32. The majority followed false gods many times in the Old Testament. The majority of the leaders hated Jesus. The majority of the world hates Christians. The majority voted in Bill Clinton twice, for heaven's sake. I mean, the majority can be wrong, all right? Can be dead wrong. But it's not true that all scientists believe in creation. There's a book here by Robert Gentry. Uh, Robert Gentry is a good friend of mine from uh, uh, Tennessee. He is a very famous scientist who did work on the disposal of radioactive waste, nuclear waste. What do you do with this waste product? He would do research on the uh, granites around the world. He discovered that as you look at granites under a microscope, you find they got little tiny halos in them. Radio polonium halos. We'll get into more of that later. But as soon as they found out that his research was proving evolution is not true, because he really proves the earth was never a hot molten mass. He never mentioned creation, never mentioned God, just purely scientific research. They published him in all the major journals until somebody said, wow, Guys, Gentry's work is proving the Big Bang Theory wrong. They got, took away his funding and shut him off like a spigot. They persecuted somebody just because his work was not supporting the sacred cow, i.e. evolution. Uh, Roger DeHart is, uh, was a science teacher at Burlington Edson High School near Seattle. He was told, he, they brought him into the office and said, you cannot tell your students about errors in the textbooks. All he was doing was bringing in current science journals. Here's a textbook that says the baby has gill slits, like we covered on video four. DeHart would bring in a science journal, says, guys, I'm sorry, it says on the, in the textbook on page you know, 220 that the baby has gills. That's not true. Here's a current science journal. See, here's the evidence. He never mentioned God, never mentioned the Bible, never mentioned creation. He just said this textbook's not accurate, and they told him he couldn't do that. You can't inform your students that the book is out of date? <laughs> That's the kind of persecution Christians get. When they, or anybody gets when they try to go against this evolution theory. Evolution is a carefully protected state religion. Just like communism was a carefully protected state religion when you grew up over there. You don't dare question it. Okay? Kevin Haley was a biology teacher in Oregon. He lost his job simply because he exposed errors in the textbooks. He told them, hey, this book's not right. There's a mistake here. They said, you're fired. Can't teach if you say there's errors in our books. Baylor University in Waco, Texas fired William Dembski in April 2000, simply because he told his students there might be an intelligent designer. He said, oh, you're not allowed to say that, so they fired him. This is Baylor, it used to be a Christian college, okay? Forrest Mims was a science writer for years. He wrote for many major journals, uh, National Geographic, Science Digest, American Journal of Physics. He wrote for all kinds of articles for magazines. But then when he applied for a job at uh, Scientific American, he was denied. They said, you can't work here because you are a creationist. Even though what he was writing on has nothing whatsoever to do with the subject of creation or evolution, they said, we don't want you on our staff because it would look bad if we hired a creationist. That's the type of persecution you get. Rod Levesque was told, he, he told his students, I kind of doubt this Darwin theory is true. So they took him away from teaching biology and gave him another job. They said, you don't, we don't want you teaching biology because you might make our students doubt Darwin's theory. That's how it's protected. It's a religion. There's a teacher in Indiana, Dan Clark, his principal called him in, Ed Eller, or the superintendent, and said he could not introduce creation to his class. Now, there's no law against teaching creation at all. There are no court cases that says you can't teach creation. It, they just said you can't be mandatory. But teachers always have the right to teach creation. But here's the problem. The law says you can teach it. The court says you can teach it. But your boss now says you can't. So he quit his job finally over that. He stood firm and said, look, I'm not... I'm not going to bow to this one. He quit his job. Dean Kenyon wrote the book, Pandas and People. 
he was a science teacher at San Francisco State University. He wrote this book and says, it, it's, a, it's a biology textbook, basically, a science textbook, that says, hey, you know, there must have been some kind of designer. This is so complicated, this is amazing. There must have been a designer. It doesn't try to get him saved or converted to be a Baptist or a Buddhist or a Catholic. It just says, look, there must be a designer. He was a tenured biology professor, San Francisco State University. He had written all kinds of books about evolution when he believed in it. Then he got converted and said, you know, I really doubt that theory is true. It's just, it doesn't work. And so they fired him. But he was tenured, so he sued them and got his job back, and they put him in as a lab assistant washing test tubes, stuff that, you know, the students do. He had to sue him again to get his real job back. Just because he said, I think there might be a creator to this universe. That's the type of persecution you get. When I spoke in Lubbock, Texas uh, several years ago, <clears throat> they had a professor there named Dr. Dini, D-I-N-I, who teaches biology. He told, he told his students, if you don't believe in evolution, don't come ask me for a recommendation to go off to medical school, because I won't give you one. He said, it's all on, it was on his website for years. He said, if you don't believe in evolution, you'll never get a recommendation from me. Well, when I went to speak there in Lubbock, Texas, the students offered Dr. Denny $1,000 if he would debate me for two hours, and he refused. Thousand bucks for two hours. That's pretty good money, Leah. How'd you like to make $1,000 for two hours? I mean, that, he said, no, he won't do it. The persecution that happens against Christians and against creationists in the secular school system is, is mind-boggling. What are they afraid of? So I say, well, it's not true that all scientists believe in creation, but many scientists that do believe in creation are afraid to say anything because they know the kind of persecution you're going to get. How many teachers were there in Ukraine that did not believe in communism but didn't dare say anything about it? You know, anybody, even, if you don't even smile right at Stalin, he'd kill you. You know, you'd end up in the gulag someplace. That's the kind of thing that's happened in America, believe it or not. If a person doesn't support the evolution theory vocally and actively, they'll be banished to academic Siberia. They lose their grant money. They will lose their uh, job. <laughs> you know, it's sad. And Patrick Henry College was told back in November of uh, 2002, I believe, that they, they weren't going to get accreditation because they didn't teach enough evolution in their college. There's an article in Agape Press here. A university professor said she was asked to resign for introducing elite students to flaws in Darwinian thought at the Mississippi University of, for Women. I spoke just north of there a few weeks after this happened. I talked to some of the people involved. This lady was told she had to resign her job because she was her, her teaching might make students doubt Darwinism. What are they going to school for? In education or indoctrination? <laughs> yeah, you're going to get an education, I thought. And it used to be that way, but it's just not anymore. It's pretty sad. And this lady said that this professor that wanted to fire her hadn't even heard her speech. But she was, you know, raising doubts about Darwinism. Um, all kinds of scientists down through history, I mean like thousands of them, all the branches of science were started by creationists. There's a list, there's a good list on Answers in Genesis. Just go to AnswersInGenesis.org website and type in scientists who believe creation. And it'll bring up all kinds of articles and you can read about all these scientists down through history who have been creationists, very famous scientists. I've often asked evolutionists, I say, guys, can you name me one advancement in modern science we've had because of the evolution theory? Is that why we have computers? Is that why we have, you know, telephones, radios? Is that why we went to the moon? What advancements can be named because of this evolution theory? They've never given an answer. There is nothing. The theory is useless. But all major science, all the whole branches of science in the last 400 years were started by creationists. Now, they weren't all young earth creationists like me, and they certainly weren't all independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical Baptists like me. But they were, you know, creationists. Werner von, von Braun, the head of our space program, was a creationist. Uh, A.E. Wildersmith, William Ramsey, the Wright brothers, they studied birds. They said, we want to see how the designer, the creator, how God made the birds, and we'll learn how to make an airplane by studying airplanes. The guy who invented the MRI, Magnetic Resonance Imaging Machine, is a young earth creationist. There are creationists today. There are a couple good books we have in our library or for sale on our website. In Six Days is one and On the Seventh Day. This is uh, 50 scientists who believe in creation. Here's 40 more scientists who believe in creation. You can get these. these are, there are thousands of scientists who do believe in creation, do not believe in evolution. Karl Popper, a famous uh, uh, leading philosopher of science. He said, evolution is not a fact. Evolution doesn't even qualify as a theory or hypothesis. It's a metaphysical research program. It's not really testable science. Evolution is a religion. And they get so angry when I tell them that. 
which is probably why I tell him that you know every few minutes because I enjoy pushing the right buttons. You know, Julian Huxley, his grandfather, uh, the Thomas Huxley, was the guy who really pushed Darwin when Darwin's book came out. Julian Huxley said, "I suppose the reason we leapt at Origin of Species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. We don't want God telling us what to do." That's why they've accepted evolution. Uh, Michael Ruse said, "Evolution is promulgated, uh, promoted by its practitioners as more than a mere science." Evolution is promulgated as an ideology of secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. He said, I am an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. But I must admit that in this one complaint, and Mr. Gish is one of many to make it, the literalists are right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it's true of evolution still today. Evolution is a religion in every sense of the word. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It's useless. So it's not true. They all believe it. Nearly all branches of science were started by creationists. Evolution theories added nothing to science. When students or professors fear expressing their real honest thoughts, they're not getting educated. They're getting indoctrinated. Students get flunked for not supporting the evolution theory. Every week when I go out and speak, somebody will come to me and say, when I was in biology class, I wrote a paper and they, the teacher gave me an F because it didn't support evolution or because I dared to go against the evolution theory. I get calls like that. Uh, Diane, you take some of the calls and transfer them over to me. Students saying, hey, what, what do I do? My teacher gave me an F because I didn't, my, teach, my paper went against evolution. It's sad. I mean, it's discrimination. All the advancements in modern technology have nothing to do with evolution. Evolution is a hindrance to science, not, uh, not a help at all. One guy in Science Magazine admitted, the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. Nobody knows how stars can form from dust clouds. No one has unambiguously observed material falling into an embryonic star, which should be happening if the star is truly still forming. And no one has caught a molecular cloud in the act of collapsing. Precisely how a section of interstellar cloud collapses gravitationally into a star a double or multiple star or a solar system is still a challenging theoretical problem. Astronomers have yet to find an interstellar cloud in the actual process of collapse. The origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary physics. This guy said, no one really understands how star formation proceeds. It's really remarkable. Nobody knows how this happens. So if they tell you new stars are forming, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're confused or they're lying. Because nobody knows how it happens. There's not even a good theory how you could squeeze dust into a star, not e and there's certainly no evidence. But here's what happens. They see bright spots appear in the clouds, or not in the clouds, in the star, uh, dust clouds in space. They look at this crab nebula or eagle nebula, and they're staring at it, and all of a sudden one day a spot gets a little brighter. Oh wow, a star is being born. That's immediately their conclusion, that a star is being born. I say, wait, wait, wait. Maybe the dust in front of it is clearing and the star was already there. Hmm? Maybe it's a star blowing up. Maybe it's another supernova. Because that's what happens when stars supernova, they get really bright. They don't know that a star is forming. So don't let them tell you that we've seen stars form. Nobody has seen such a thing. All we do is we see them blow up, which is the opposite of what evolutionists need. Now, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and he made the stars also. Here, God is claiming He made the stars, and it says in Psalm, He counts the number of the stars. Not only how many there are total, but each one has its own number. So God will say, oh, this is star number 42 trillion, you know, 718 billion. He, he, he knows the number of each one. And it says, praise Him, ye waters that be above the heavens, in Psalm 148.
you know, that he picks up and shakes once in a while. How you doing in there? You know, <laughs> I don't know. I like to think that way. But the Psalm 148, the waters that be above the heavens, you know, people have often asked, hey, where does, where's the last star? And once we find it, what's on the other side? I don't know the answers to those, but just a possibility is that there, according to the Bible, may still be water above the heavens. But there's a lot of stars out there. Stephen Hawking said, stars are so far away, they appear to be just pinpoints of light. We cannot see their size or shape. How do we tell different types of stars apart? For the vast majority, there's only one thing we can see, and that is the color of their light. If you get the biggest telescope on Earth, this is not it, by the way, <coughs> spotting scope, but if you get the largest telescope on Earth, and look at the closest star, which is Alpha Centauri, four and a half light years away, all you're going to see is a dot. If I focus this in on the sun, it'll start to get you know, bigger and bigger, and you can actually flames, see flames leaping off, and see the spicules, and you can see color changes, and you can actually see features of the sun. When you look at a star, you never get to see that. Nobody has ever seen a star as far as any of the features of it. You get the biggest telescope on Earth, it's going to be nothing but a dot in your scope. All you can tell is, I say, that's a red one, that's a yellow one, that's a blue one. That's all you can see. So, I think we should look at the stars and say, wow, what a mighty God we serve. Instead of going out there and say, well, we know how far that way it is, we know it evolved. I mean, it's just that egotistical attitude some of these atheists get that makes you want to slap them in the face, like, man, why don't you serve God? Look what he made, you know? Here's the things to consider concerning starlight, then we'll take a break. Number one, we cannot measure these great distances. It just cannot be done. Number two, nobody knows what light is. Is it, they call it a wave or a photon or a particle. You know, we, we, we know what it does. We use it all the time. But actually, give me a jar of it and paint it red. Nobody knows the substance of it. What is light? And we sure don't know that it always travels the same speed all through time or space. The entire theory behind a black hole is that light can be attracted by gravity. Well, if light can be attracted by gravity, then you cannot say the speed of light is a constant. Okay? At Harvard University back in 99, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year they slowed it down to one mile an hour, and the next year brought it to a dead stop. Light goes, you know, pretty quick, 186,000 miles a second. They slowed it down. It was done at Harvard, it was done at Smithsonian, it was done at Cambridge University. A repeatable, demonstrable experiment. Now that is science. If you do an experiment, get a result, somebody else follows your data, does the same experiment, gets the same result, that's science. They slowed light down. This article came out on Fox News Channel. They said, we've succeeded in holding a light pulse still. They brought the speed of light to zero, brought it to a dead stop. Meanwhile, back in 2000 at Princeton University, they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. So when somebody says that star is 10 billion light years away, which I doubt they can measure, therefore that we can prove the universe is 10 billion years old, they got several problems in their logic right away that they probably don't see, which is why we do these seminars, so we can help people understand. It's 300 times the speed of light. Uh, astronomer Barry Setterfield, an Australian government astronomer, said, During the last 300 years, 164 measurements of the speed of light have been published using 16 different measurement techniques. The speed of light has apparently decreased so rapidly 
experimental error cannot explain it. This is a chart showing the decline in the speed of light from the published numbers in the last 150 years. You notice the decline in the chart. The speed of light is getting slower until about 1960. For the last 40 years, anybody that's measured the speed of light gets the same number. 186,282.4, I think, miles per second. Who cares? Well, <clears throat> it could be that it's, it leveled off in 1960 for two possible reasons. Three possible reasons. Our way of measuring is getting better. Instruments are getting better. We're smarter. You know, everybody in the past was dumb. We're smart. We got it right. Could be. That's what they'll tell you. Second option, though, is we're at the tail end of a logarithmic curve, and you're much less likely to see any decline. As you get further out on the logarithmic curve, it pretty much levels out. But a third reason is 1956 is when they invented the atomic clock. And they started using that as their clock to measure the speed of light. Well, now, wait, wait, wait. The atomic clock is based on the wavelength of a cesium-133 atom. So the clock is based on the speed of light. Now, if you have a clock based on the speed of light and you're measuring the speed of light with it, if the speed of light changes, you're never going to catch it with that clock. It's like watching two twi twins grow next to each other. Well, neither one's growing. <laughs> well, duh. you got a rubber ruler problem here. Clear back in 87, they said, the speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero. There must have been a faster speed of light. There have been articles from the 80s, 90s, 2000s saying, look, the speed of light is not a constant. They said, no physical law prevents anything from exceeding the speed of light. In two published experiments, the speed of light was apparently exceeded by as much as a factor of 100. The Big Bang Theory requires a much faster speed of light. Uh, Dr. Magluelchi, however you pronounce his name here, I got his book on the table. He says, a shocking possibility is the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. Could it be the speed of light was faster? Here's an article in uh, the newspaper said, speed of light may have changed over history, study says. Winnipeg Free Press, nothing's reliable, not even the speed of light. We have shown that a time-varying speed of light could provide a resolution to well-known cosmological puzzles. One of the mysteries of a decaying speed of light seems to be able to explain why opposite extremes of the cosmos that are too far apart to have been in contact with each other appear to obey the same rules of physics and even about the same temperatures. It would only be possible for light to cross from one side to the other if it traveled much faster than today, moments after the universe was created. Is the speed of light really a constant? The articles here in Reuters News Service, the speed, light, speed of light may not be a constant. I have dozens of articles like this in the last 15 years, and this will be much more detail in our college class about the speed of light. So don't let somebody tell you the speed of light is a constant. We don't know that. Big article came out in Discover Magazine. says, was Einstein wrong about the speed of light back in 2000? He said, yeah, Einstein was wrong. The speed of light is not a constant. There's the book by the Italian scientist. I'm assuming he's Italian. He says, look, the speed of light is not a constant. And there have been many articles published about this. You can read them for yourself. I'll flash to them quickly here and you can get the details. So the third thing to consider. The creation was finished when God made it. Not only can we not measure those distances, not only is the speed of light not necessarily a constant, the creation was done. See, Jesus made wine out of grapes that never existed. He missed all that time. Instead of going from the water in the ground, through the plant, into the grape, squeeze it, make the wine, now drink it. No, Jesus turned the water straight to wine. What happened to all the intermediate steps? God can bypass all that. He doesn't need any of that. Okay? I asked people the question, how old was Adam on day six? Anybody know how old was Adam on day six? Zero. Did he look zero? No. He looked 52, 53 next month. But uh, he looked perfect top, you know, physical condition. God didn't make two babies and put them in the Garden of Eden and hand them a package of seeds and say, here, plant these quick. You're going to need supper. <laughs> it has to be a full-grown man, full-grown woman, full-grown garden. They got to have supper like tonight, you know. Better be something hanging on the tree ready to eat. Even if you plant a tree, you're going to take four or five years to get fruit off it. So the creation had to be mature. A fourth thing to consider about the speed of light question. A light year is a distance. It's not a time. It's a distance. And since the speed of light is not proven to be consistent, why would star distance have anything to do with the age of the universe? Meaning of the zodiac, he goes through the, the 12 zodiac symbols and says probably these originally had a gospel story to them. 
which has now been perverted into the horoscope. So get CoralRidge.org if you want to get the book. It's like six or eight bucks. But the Bible does talk about the constellations. It talks about Pleiades and Orion in the book of Job chapter 38, or Maseroth and Arcturus in Job 38. There are constellations mentioned in the Bible. Now what does this mean? Well, I don't know, and I don't know anybody who knows for sure, but here's what some Christians think. That when God originally made the world, Adam did not have a Bible. It hadn't been written yet. So God gave Adam the gospel story in the stars. The twelve different constellations told the story of the redemption, the coming of Christ, and maybe they, the, the Sphinx was built, this is a, one theory, the Sphinx by the pyramid, you know, in Egypt, they say, well, the Sphinx was built to tell us how to read the Zodiac, because it starts with the face of a woman and ends with the body of a lion. So you start reading the Zodiac. Instead of starting in January like we do, you start with Virgo the Virgin, and you go through the twelve constellations and end with Leo the Lion. I don't know. I know that today the horoscope's all perverted and Satan always takes what God does and twists it and perverts it and chains it, but if you want to study that, that's fine. There appears to be something to that, though, that maybe there really is something to this gospel in the stars. And Carl Baugh's got a good theory that each of the constellations is producing different radio waves. <coughs> stars produce radio waves. He thinks the canopy of ice that used to be above the Earth could actually change those radio frequencies into audible waves, like a crystal radio does. It would actually vibrate. And Adam and Eve would be able to hear the music of the stars mentioned in Job chapter 38. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it sure preaches good that the whole gospel story was being sung to them continually as they traveled around every year. Who knows? Anyway, second question. Is the sun shrinking? There has been some controversy among creationist groups in the last 10 years over this question. The sun is shrinking. There's not much question about that. But does that prove it's not billions of years old? Well, I think so. The sun is burning, obviously. You can step outside and look at it. It's losing about 5 million tons every second. Quite a weight loss program. Well, that means, of course, it used to be bigger. You don't need to be too much of a genius to figure that out. Uh, Bulletin of American Astronomical Society ran an article back in 79, which some people have argued about, the legitimacy of this, but they said, since 1836, more than 100 different observers at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, that's in England, and the U.S. Naval Observatory have made direct visual measurements that suggest the sun's diameter is shrinking at a rate of a tenth of a percent each century, or about five feet an hour. Let's assume that is correct for the moment. If the sun is burning and it's losing five feet an hour, that would be the diameter. So the radius, it would only be two and a half feet of radius. It's 93 million miles to the Earth. You divide that by two and a half feet per hour, you're going to find out it cannot possibly be billions of years old. That, of course, would assume several things. Has the rate always been the same? You know, has the rate of burn always been the same, et cetera, et cetera? I know there's a lot of assumptions built in. But I think we could all agree the sun is burning. I think we could all agree it's getting smaller. Uh, several indirect techniques also confirm the sun is shrinking although these inferred about one-seventh as much from Science Magazine. Here's a chart showing the graph of what has been observed, written down. I mean, they look at the sun, they measure the diameter using trigonometry, and it's close enough to work that way, that <clears throat> they measure the numbers and say, wow, the sun's diameter, polar and equatorial, is shrinking. Now, I know the sun oscillates. It swells and contracts and swells. You know, it's, burn it's burning like a marshmallow, you know. But generally, you can see from the graph, it is losing diameter, losing size. Well, <clears throat> if you go back billions of years, of years, you would assume this would make a problem. If the sun were bigger, it would pretty soon absorb Mercury and then Venus and then Earth. I don't know how far back it could have to go. And I think Christians would be wise to not put a number on it. Don't say, well, you know, 18.6 million years ago this would happen. Because what happens, the atheists then argue about the number and they miss the whole point. They miss the concept. The fact is, guys, it's burning, it used to be bigger, this creates a problem for your theory. Because the sun, if you go back in time, would have been dimmer. This creates a problem. How can plants have survived with the changing brightness of the sun also? Evolutionists maintain that life appeared on the earth about 3.8 billion years ago. Since then, the sun would have brightened 25%. Well, if the sun is 25% brighter now than it was then, how could plants have evolved? It goes through some good legitimate points here. The, the faint young sun paradox is a problem for those who believe in evolution. He says the logical conclusion he comes to is, it's not billions of years old. 
And of course, the other astronomers say, oh, that's not possible. Of course, you know, it's billions of years old. Of course it is. You know, they don't like that idea. Okay, what about carbon dating? I get asked this question all the time. Jonathan spent $70 to get this book, right? And the new one's out, and it's $80 now? $80. $80, okay. Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth, the RATE Project, R-A-T-E. <clears throat> This former Fortune 500 CEO and consultant to CBS for several primetime television specials has uncovered new scientific evidence proving the accuracy of the Bible. Next on this edition of It's Supernatural. Centuries have come and gone, offering wisdom and understanding throughout the ages. Today, there should be nothing beyond one's power to discover. And yet, the strange, unusual, and mysterious world of the supernatural defies understanding. Stay tuned for a unique and powerful investigation into a curious, undiscovered universe only on It's Supernatural. Big subject, there's many reasons. I think uh, the first discovery, there's two discoveries in our, in our way of thinking that will make this clear. The first discovery is that we have here 66 books that were penned by over 40 different guys mm -hmm. over thousands of years, and yet we now discover it evidences a deliberate design from end to end. And I don't mean just in theme. We discover that every number, every, every letter, every place name s appears to be deliberately in place by deliberate, de skillful design. But the second discovery, for the first discovery is the integrity of the whole, mm -hmm. which is startling. But the second discovery is that it has to do with its origin. See, we, for, let me back up a little bit, Said we all assume that time is linear and absolute. And we do that well, because- That's what we live in, well, that yeah, type of situation. And in school, the teacher right. wrote a line on the blackboard from left to right. The left mm -hmm. end was the birth of somebody, the founding of an empire or whatever, and the right end was the end mm -hmm. of that person or empire. So we tend, from that experience, to think that time is linear and absolute. From that background, when we start talking about eternity or God, mm -hmm. we tend to imagine someone who has lots of time. We tend to think of eternity as a line that starts at infinity on the left and goes to infinity on the right. That God is simply someone who has lots of time. Well, that's poetic and it's useful in our songs and things, but it's bad physics. Because we know from Einstein's theory of relativity that time is a physical property. Time varies with mass, acceleration, or gravity. Now, is God subject to gravity? Of course not. So God is not somebody who has lots of time. God is somebody that dwells outside the restrictions of the physical world. That'd be a great realm to dwell in. <laughs> exactly. Well, the point is, if God has the technology to create us in the first place, he has the technology to get a message to us. But how does he authenticate the message? How does he let us know that the message mm -hmm. is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or a fraud of some kind? One way, probably there's many answers to that, we'll talk about a few, but one of the answers is to demonstrate that the origin of his message is from outside time. And that's what Isaiah means when he says that it is he that inhabiteth eternity. Okay, so how does he demonstrate this? By writing history before it happens. He's, he declares that he alone knows the end from the beginning. Let me use an analogy to get this across. Let's assume we're watching a major parade. We're sitting on the okay. curb and around the corner comes the marching units, the bands, whatever. For us, sitting at that curb, the parade is a sequence of events. But to someone who's outside the plane of, ex of that existence, say in the chopper above, they could see the beginning and the end simultaneously. Of course. And that's exactly the position God, God is. But, but, but Chuck, a lot of skeptics say the predictions or the prophecies in the Bible are so general that of course they come true. They could, they're not that specific. How would you respond? They are shockingly, astonishingly, Specific. Give me an example. Well, uh, the most the, the most interesting ones tend to get a little technical, um, but let me give you a. I mean, that's specific that they're too technical. Sometimes. Well, exactly. But let me <laughs> let me give you a simple one okay. that people may find provocative. Uh, this is a more subtle thing, but at the same time, I think it'll be provocative, and that's the genealogy in Genesis chapter five. And what do you mean by that? Well, it, when you read the book of Genesis, the first few chapters are kind of interesting. You've got the creation, you've got the, the whole incident mm -hmm. in the garden and all of that. That's straightforward. Mm -hmm. But we get to chapter, and from chapter 6 on, you've got the flood of Noah and all of that. But chapter 5 
is one of those chapters that we tend to skip over because it's a genealogy it's of 10 people. It's got a lot people. of names, right. Just names. And uh, we have 10 people there from Adam. It's ge basically the genealogy mm -hmm. from Adam to Noah. And when, when we read that in the English Bible, we stumble in a sense because the names are not translated. Name, we don't translate names. My formal name, they call me Chuck, but I'm Charles. What does Charles mean? Different people have different opinions. No one mm -hmm. knows what that means. Well, in the Hebrew, though, you can infer the meaning of the names, names because of the meaning. roots. They're, yes. They're, so let's just go through a few of mm -hmm. these, okay? Adam is pretty straightforward. That's man, right? Adama, right. Man, okay. He had a son by the name of Seth. And, and what does Seth imply? It, it's a root that implies appointed. We get a clue from that from uh, the previous chapter. When Eve gave birth to Seth, she felt he was appointed to be a replacement for Abel, That's whom correct. Cain slew. So the word Seth suggests mm -hmm. appointed. When Seth has a son, his name is Enosh, which from, comes from Anash. It's a, an incurable wound or woe mm -hmm. or grief or whatever. It means mortal, in effect. Enosh has a son by the name of Canaan. It's some English Bibles have it misappropriated in Canaan. No, it's Kenan. In fact, Balaam does a pun on, Ken uh, on the Kenites in Numbers 24. It, it really mm -hmm. means sorrow. We go on. Now, those two guys probably had a belly full of these horrible names, you know, mortal and sorrow. So when, when uh, Kenan had a son, he named him Mahalalel. Mahal, Mahalal is the blessed or praised one. L is the name for God. So, so what you're doing, though, is if, if I'm understanding you right, yeah. is you're taking the the names in look, Genesis in order and looking at the Hebrew roots, what they imply, what they the, what they imply. So there, we have ten names. Ten names. And when we find out what each one of these ten mean, it's an exploration. We, Let's see what they say. Okay. And uh, Mahalalel has a son by the name of Yared. Mm -hmm. And Yared has a, which means, uh, shall, it's a verb, shall, Yarad, shall come down. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, Enoch, which is an academic term, um, meaning commencement or teaching. Mm -hmm. Now, Enoch's perhaps one of the more interesting ones. I should back up. Most people don't realize that the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It was preached on for four generations. But what we learn about Enoch is when he was 65, something very strange happened, because from that day on, it says he walked with God, whatever that means. Sounds good to me. Yeah, exactly. Well, Enoch apparently had a, a prophecy that as long as his son that was just born would mm -hmm. live, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. So he named him after two Hebrew roots, Muth, which means his death, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, from a derivative of the verb shalak, which shall bring. The name Methuselah actually means his death shall bring. It's suggestive mm -hmm. of that prophecy that was given when he was born. So we, so we have a sentence now by those it's names. It's coming. i got a couple more, and then we'll okay. look at it. Uh, his, Methuselah's son was Lamech. Now, here's a root that we use in English. Lament. Mm -hmm. so, it, you know, it, it, uh, it means despairing. And uh, Lamech has a son by the name of Noah. We've all heard of Noah. But his name comes from Noah, which means uh, comfort. In fact, Lamech tells us that. He, says he, the, he tells us why he named him Noah. He says, the same shall comfort us concerning our work and to our hands and so forth. So now we have these names, and if we read them in English, they're meaningless to us. Adam, Seth, Enosh, and so forth. Of course. Let's read them with the English implications of the roots, as I just yes. said. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death, God's death, shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. That Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort. Sid Roth here with Chuck Missler, and he said, well, I'll just give you a little subtle reason why we believe in the integrity of the Bible. So what does he do? He turns to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and uh, he looks at the genealogy in the fifth chapter. It's ten names. We know them by whatever the name says. But what he said is whatever the name says has a meaning. And the meanings form a sentence. So if you take each of the first ten names in order, the exact meaning, it'll form a sentence. And what is that sentence? Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death, God's death, shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. That's absolutely amazing. Well, there's a couple of textual issues here. First of all, you'll never convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide this summary of what would be called the Christian gospel in a genealogy in the Torah. 
No well, way. Well, obviously, they're not going to hide it. But what I'd like to know is, have you ever had occasion to share that with a Jewish rabbi? Oh, yes, we have. And, and uh, in fact... So uh, what does the rabbi say beyond... <gasps> Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, 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 it's not the kind of thing that constitutes a proof. Mm -hmm. It's really just a discovery that points in a direction. And uh, now there, uh, there are other examples that are crisper, but a little more technical. Uh, in Daniel chapter 9, now, now let, let, here's the key points. The Old Testament, as we would call it, was translated into Greek for, in, in 285 B.C. To, through mm -hmm. 270 under uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus. He's funded it. They wanted, they needed a copy of the Jewish scriptures in mm -hmm. Greek, because that's what everybody spoke in those days. So right. they translated it. The importance of this is that we have copies of that, and it was done in the third century before Christ was born. In that document, we have, of course, the book of Daniel. Set aside who wrote under what conditions. It's there in black mm -hmm. and white. Daniel prays, concerned about for his people, is visited by Gabriel, which gives him, Daniel, a four-verse prophecy that lays out, in effect, everything forthcoming. But what it includes, the Gabriel says to Daniel, bear in mind he's in slavery in Babylon, mm -hmm. Jerusalem is in rubble several hundred miles to the west. He says when the, the, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the king, will be a certain number of days. And when you work out the arithmetic from the language, it's 173,880 days. Okay. okay. We know the date of that decree. Mm -hmm. It was Artaxerxes Longimanus in 14... Thanks to Sir Robert Anderson, head of Scotland Yard way back when, in 1894 published a book which, in which he went to the trouble of nailing that date down. When we count the days from there, then the problem is when does it end? It ends when Messiah the King. Now if you study the Gospels, you discover that Jesus, several times he tried to take and make him as a king, but he'd just slip away. He says, my hour has not yet come. Then one day he does something weird. He not only permits it, he arranges it. Tells his disciples to go to a certain place, give him a password, get a donkey. He rides the donkey, deliberately fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, riding the donkey in Jerusalem. When you look at those dates, it comes out to the exact day, to the exact day, it's 173,880 days, oh. that uh, Gabriel told Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Now, uh, that's to me absolutely breathtaking for several reasons. All right, let, let me see if I, I get this straight okay. now. We had a starting point. Starting point from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And, and then the exact number of years that it would take. Yes, it, it, it's expressed in a strange way that gets in this mm -hmm. text. Basically, it's 173,880 days. Okay, and then what would happen at that point? To the Messiah the King. To oh, his birth? The or? only day. No, this, it says the Messiah the King. Ah. So now, all through his ministry, king. all through his ministry, several times you're going to take him and make him as a king, the enthusiasm mm -hmm. of the crowd. He slips away. Mine hour has not yet come. Then one day he deliberately allows himself to ride this donkey into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday or the mm -hmm. triumphal entry, in which as they go, his disciples sing Psalm 118. And, and the Pharisees are upset because they recognize that in the context that that's happening, they're blasphemy. They're calling him the Messiah. Sure, there's the 118th Psalm says the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and and, and, and we uh, chant this at Pesach, yes. at Passover. And I think it's verse 26: "Is blessed is the King that cometh in the King that cometh <laughs> in the name of the Lord." They're saying that. The Pharisees around there are upset because they realize these guys are inadvertently blaspheming. Master, you rebuke your disciples. He says, if they held their peace, the very stones would cry out. In other words, he encourages it. Mm -hmm. He, in effect, is allowing himself at that moment to be presented to Jerusalem as king. Right, as king. It turns out that's 173,880 days from the date of that decree to rebuild Jerusalem. It comes out, when you go through the trouble of going through the arithmetic, it comes out precisely to the very day. Now, you fact, are a had, you're a logical man. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any way to explain that beyond the fact that God knew what would happen? Exactly. I think this represents such an unequivocal demonstration that Jesus Christ really was who he claimed to be. That was the, when I was a teenager, when I discovered that, it was shown to me, uh, it blew me away. And I, of course, obviously through the last, what, 40 years, been studying it even more carefully. I, I, it's I, staggering. I have, to, I have to ask you, again, have you ever shared this with a Jewish rabbi? Oh, and, sure. And, and what is the reaction? Well, it varies. Some, some reactions are one of staggering acceptance and getting mm -hmm. into it, investigating further. And of course, all of these things have ways to be denied or refuted or dismissed or mm -hmm. shined on. You know, we've all done that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as they say, we have 
two Jews, you've got three opinions. So there's all kinds of, of, of uh, views. But if you take the trouble to study it carefully, the last four verses of Daniel 9, it, it, and the more you can get into the original Hebrew, the clearer it becomes. And you contrast that with what in Luke chapter 19, you discover a number of things. Not only does it predict the exact day, you discover if you look carefully at Luke 19, that Jesus held them accountable to know that day. And it's that point that he predicts the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., that not one stone would be left upon another and all that. And, uh, and the, the passage in Daniel also describes that after this, the Messiah will be karat, cut off, executed. The Old Testament actually presents that the Messiah will be killed. And indeed he was, of course, on the cross. And so you and I are beneficiaries of love story. Now, written in blood on now, the wooden cross. The thing that's so amazing. You know, I something is more than that. I think it takes openness. You know, so many of us are victims of our cultural background, and we're mm -hmm. blinded by prejudices, not from the scripture, but by what people have said about the scripture. They'll believe some popular speaker or some allegorical interpretation rather than just read it. I think God says what he means and means what he says. And very simple is to be open minded and get into. Hear him, God, what, what he's saying, not what some interpreter has said. Out of curiosity, with the background that you have so extensive uh, in the corporate world, how did you become so convinced the Bible was from God? Well, my technical background is really in the information sciences. And I think one of the things that uh, staggered me as I began to discover the integrity of design of all these different books, 66 of them over thousands of years, realizing that they have been managed by some unseen hand. You, the, you discover, as you get into it, the, the, the truth is in the details. Every number, every place name, every detail is there by design, and the design evidences knowledge of what's coming, what the end is. And uh, Christ's life being the best example, that uh, there's over 300 details of his life that was fulfilled while he did his ministry. His death on the cross fulfills all kinds of details in the Torah and in the Psalms and elsewhere. And so it's the precision of that and the recognition that, that precision could only have been established by someone outside space-time itself that blows you away. And it's right there. You can study it. It's tangible. It's, you can get your hands on it. What so. is the best thing you would say to an agnostic, an honest agnostic, or a atheist? I talk to the honest agnostic. I investigate. I just, if he's honest and he's open, it's the most important thing of his life. Because if there is truth here, and that truth is going to determine his destiny, it deserves a high priority investigation. But what about Darwin? What, what about this whole evolution business? Well, now that's, you know, you put your finger on the greatest myth of our society. It imbues our psychology, our culture, not just biology, the whole. And today, the good news is scientists are finally beginning to admit that Darwinism or evolution as we talk, that's a very imprecise term. What we really mean is the biogenesis, that life began mm -hmm. as, a, and, uh, uh, as an accident, defies all the scientific evidence. You know, we have a spectrum of possibilities. Things well, wait, if it defies the scientific evidence, why do we believe it? Um, cultural pressure, career uh, uh, planning. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people fired that if, they dis if, if the staff discovers their in orientation. And yet, uh, there are books like Philip Johnson's Darwin on Trial, Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box. Give me one reason why it is unscientific, one. Uh, it's it violates all the entropy laws. It's impossible. Natural selection, which is the premise mm -hmm. of Darwinism, can only operate if there's something to select. It doesn't operate to create a, uh, inanimate material from, I mean, animate material from inanimate chemicals. It takes, the, it takes in, the, the Darwinist theory is if you have matter and energy and you mix those together, you can get life. Mm -hmm. It's an unbalanced equation. Matter and energy plus information. What, what the Darwinist cannot explain is the origin, not of life, of information. Because if something is highly probable, it happens all the time, we call that a scientific law. If something's highly improbable, we call that design. That's what cryptography deals with. You've got a rant, what looks to be a jumble of letters, but if you discover in those letters design, a message, that's called cryptography or a detective, forensics. When you have a highly improbable event that's occurred, we impute design. So life lies between those two boundaries, either highly probable, which is like a scientific mm -hmm. law, highly predictable. Most of life's in the middle. We call that chance. But if it's highly unlikely to have occurred by chance, we call that design. Well, as you start looking at, the, for example, let's take the best example is DNA. You have a DNA molecule that is, we now discover, 
is a three out of four error correcting code. Now, first of all, it's a digital code. Like Paul Revere, uh, one if by land, two if by sea. Then why a, couldn't that just happen? Because it has, a digital code takes significance by prearrangement. Of course. It can't happen randomly. If you have code happening randomly, and you, you have to have an engine to process that code, they can't each evolve asynchronously. They have to be highly coordinated. So uh, that, that's, part, that's part of the answer. There's also a concept of irreducible complexity. If I take a mousetrap, it consists of five things, a spring, a hammer, a hook, and if I only have four of those five things, I don't catch four-fifths of a mouse. In other words, there's a point at which you can't reduce it and still have it functional. So the question is, how do you get to that functional? It turns out there is no scenario, evolutionary speaking, to get to something that has irreducible complexity. Now, when we look at what was called a simple cell in Darwin's day, we discover today that that simple cell is more complex than an entire city, an entire automated factory. And whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Stop right there. Okay. Notice the statement by Dr. Herzog, who's professor of archaeology at Tel Aviv University. This is the largest university in Israel, and you would expect that professor of archaeology there would be one who is telling you about things that support the Bible, but that's not the case. In our country, many of the universities which used to do that now are dominated by those who oppose the Bible. So we have statements like this. He says, this is what archaeologists have learned from their excavations in the land of Israel. The Israelites were never in Egypt, did not conquer the land in a military campaign, and did not pass it on to the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what we've learned from the study of archaeology. Now, why would a fellow who is professor of archaeology in Israel make a statement like that? We have to put this in a larger political context. And I think we can see that context if we compare it with a statement made by the late Yasser Arafat, who is former president of the Palestinian Authority. And I think you can appreciate why he would make a statement similar to this. He says, the notion of a Jewish origin in Jerusalem is a religious myth used to justify occupation and colonialism. Well, he's fighting a political battle. He says there never was a temple in Jerusalem, and there is no archaeological evidence anywhere this is a myth. Many of the secular Jews don't really care that much about the, the religious battle, but they know there's a lot of uh, mad Palestinians. There are a lot of, uh, there's a war going on. And they like to live in peace. They don't like their malls being blown up. And so you just don't say things that aggravate them. So it's uh, not going to help those who are religiously inclined. But so what? Peace is more important. This is the context that we see this battle going on in the middle of. In spite of the effort to establish Palestinians' right to the land or the Jewish right to the land based on archaeology, we need to just back up and, and look at the evidence and see what the actual facts are. And that's, of course, going to be our approach. We want to see what the evidence is for the Bible, for the history of Israel, from the stones of Israel. And I want to begin with the altar of Joshua, and I believe that's exactly what it is, on Mount Ebal. In Deuteronomy 27, we find the instructions given, when you've crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones about which I'm commanding you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall cover them with plaster, build an altar to the Lord with uh, an altar uh, of stones on which you've not used an iron tool, and so it's a very specific type of altar. They wrote the law in the plaster. They were excellent stone cutters at this time, just phenomenal stone cutters, but no stones that were cut were to be used here. Verse 11 says, the same day Moses charged the people as follows, when you've crossed over, uh, you'll stand on the Mount Gerizim for a blessing. Then verse 13 says, you'll stand on Mount Ebal for the curse. This is a good teaching method. We're going to read you the law. 
Now then, here's half of the group on this mountain and half of the group on the other mountain, and you're going to recite what's going to happen if you keep this law, and then the others are going to recite what's going to happen if you don't keep this law. And here are the blessings, here are the cursings. Uh, they understood exactly what happened, and of course we see those things taking place as they obeyed or as they didn't obey. But this altar was the center of that event. This is up in Samaria, and here we can see Mount Ebal, and nearby Mount Gerizim. Dr. Adam Zertal is chairman, or was chairman, of the Department of Archaeology at the University of Hoffa. He was an atheist. He was taught in his education that uh, Joshua, Moses, David, Solomon were all fictitious creatures like Zeus, and uh, you don't believe this foolishness. But he's an archaeologist, and he begins to look at what you can find from archaeology, and he uh, took the area of Manasseh, and over a period of about 20 years was doing a survey, meter by meter, of that area to see what could be found. And he found an altar. Well, he, nobody was ready to admit this was an altar on Mount Gerizim. They'd looked on top, and it wasn't there. And so they assumed the altar that you read about in Deuteronomy wasn't there. Of course, the high places were reserved for the idols. You study the Old Testament. Literally, it says this altar was in the mountain. It's about two-thirds of the way up. And when he came across this doing his survey, he reported it in the journals. Could this be Joshua's altar? Uh, and there was uh, just a, a guffaw, a just ridicule. Lawrence Staggers, professor of archaeology at, uh, of Israel at Harvard University, says, if a sacrificial altar stood on Mount Ebal, its impact on our research is revolutionary. All of us have to go back to kindergarten. Because they're teaching that none of this happened. There's no Exodus, there's no Moses, and no Joshua. But here's the altar, just as it's described in Deuteronomy. Well, it's not really an altar. It's a, it's a farmhouse, or it's a watchtower. Okay, but it's not on top of the mountain, and it's short and squatty. Not a very good watchtower. Doesn't have any windows and any doors. <laughs> not make a very good farmhouse. What is it? Well, they began to look, and we'll let Adam Zertal, in his own words, tell you the implications of this. If there was an altar on Mount Ebal, uh, the uh, most ancient and the first uh, Jewish or Israelite altar here, the meaning is that all the story of Deuteronomy and parts of the story in Joshua are scientifically true. This is, I think, absolutely so, and even the enemies understood it, and so they opposed it. Here we see the altar looking across to Mount Gerizim, uh, where the blessings were read. And I, one of the things that struck me when I was there, how do you get a group over here and a group that far away, and you hear each other? We sent Dr. Willie Dye across to the other side. He has, by the way, six earned doctorates, <laughs> Uh, archaeology from uh, Berkeley. He went across and we yelled as loud as we could yell, Dr. Dye, can you hear us? He said, yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> the acoustics were just, well, you can't believe it till you're there. It, it's, it's just astounding. Uh, it was it apparently just designed to accomplish exactly what was done. As he continued to excavate and, and look at this area, we find a large complex here where a large group of people were obviously camped. It's been restored to look like this, and obviously this short, squatty building with the ramp going up, no steps, is exactly what we see described in Deuteronomy. Probably looked like this with uh, its being covered by plaster. And we're reminded there in uh, verse 25 of Exodus 20 that it was not to be made of cut stones. You'll not go up by steps. This is in contrast to all of the Canaanite altars uh, that you might find in the area. But exactly what you find. Well, what, what do you find in the center? Well, they begin to dig down into the, the, the center of the area, and they found it was full of ashes. 
Isn't that a surprise? Uh, some of the vessels there had ashes in them. And they allowed these ashes to be examined at uh, the Department of Zoology at the University of Hoffa. They found 942 bones, indicating some 50 to 100 individuals. And what kind of animals were these? If this was a Canaanite altar, they'd be sacrificing eagles and snakes and various animals. But not so with the Israelites. What they found were sheep and goats and cattle, all kosher animals, if you please. And of the ones that they could determine, the sex and the age, all of them were one-year-old males. Wow, this is not a Canaanite altar. It's not a farmhouse. It's not a watchtower. Pottery was also found, and both culturally and uh, with thermoluminescent dating, which is most appropriate for pottery, it was dated to the time of the Exodus, approximately the 13th century. In addition, he found Egyptian scarabs that came from Egypt. This is used often to date uh, Egyptian artifacts. This is from Ramses II, which is probably the one who was reigning at the time of the Exodus, though it's not precise, but generally the time of the Exodus. All of this fits and makes a picture that's just very impressive. It was an honor to be a part of the excavation there. But let's notice the statement by Adam Zertal, who was convinced as a result of this and other evidence that he uncovered that the Old Testament was God's Word. And not only that, that the Messiah that the Old Testament predicted uh, was the Christ, and he is a believer in Christ and has established a church up there in Samaria, independent of any denominational organization. Uh, they're teaching what appears to be New Testament Christianity to me, baptism for remission of sins, and uh, about a group of 40 up there in, in the middle of Palestinian territory. He published this material. Uh, over a, a series of years, a number of uh, articles as each was discovered, and then made this comment, what has happened regarding the new accumulation of facts I have cited? Almost nothing. Since the appearance of the detailed report and the many articles I have published on the excavation, silence has descended on the scholarly world. They have nothing to say. Well, I do. Uh, I think Professor Staggard needs to go back to kindergarten. That's what he said, and I, I agree with him. We find that Adam has continued to work and decided that he would look in the area that the Bible indicated would be Gilgal. This is where they first camped when they came across the Jordan. No one had really investigated here because most of the archaeologists had no confidence that this was a true story anyway, and they hadn't looked. And so he went to look. In Joshua chapter 4, the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th of the first month, camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. Well, that's pretty specific. Now, here's where it is. Those 12 stones which had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. Well, he found the spot and found more than he anticipated finding. Uh, just was amazed. Uh, here is the diagram that he has from his research. It's in the shape of a shoe. Now, at the heel, you find a configuration that fits precisely the dimensions of the tabernacle, which is what they set up here when they came across. Out on the toe, you find a circular area there that we'll look at again in a moment. But what is this about? And as he thought about it, he reflected back on Deuteronomy chapter 11, where Moses told them, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your border will be from the wilderness to Lebanon, from the river to the Euphrates, as far as the western sea. And then Joshua said in chapter 1, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I've spoken to Moses. The people got there, and they set up this area to make the claim, This is ours. And they set up this uh, double pathway of stones, the pathway in between the, the two rows of stones, in the shape of a foot. And evidently they marched around, perhaps with the Ark of the Covenant, saying, 
basically this is ours. And that uh, heel portion that you can see again is exactly the dimensions of the tabernacle. And that circular area down near the toe has just been, that hasn't been published yet. You won't be able to read this possibly until next year. But in the middle of that circular altar appearing is 12 standing stones. I think that's awesome. <laughs> I know where those stones came from, I believe. But here is a picture of that double pathway that surrounds and defines this foot where they were making, I believe, the claim. This, this country is, is ours. As you look at this off in the distance, you see Jericho. It's on the eastern edge, just exactly where the Bible indicated it should be. As we go to Jericho, of course, a very famous area and where a great deal of archaeological work has been done, we recall Joshua chapter 6, verse 3, you'll march around the city, all the men of war, you'll do so for six days, the priests carry the ram's horns, they blow the ram's horns, the trumpets, the walls fall down on the seventh day so that the people will go up straight ahead. Pretty amazing story. Not exactly a, a reasonable sounding battle plan. Just march them to death, go around and around, and it's, it falls down. Well, this, this is not an, a normal plan. This is a supernatural plan. And a lot of archaeologists have been here. The original archaeologist, Garstang, did uh, work in the early 1900s, was confident this was Joshua's Jericho. Uh, but then that was refuted, we're told. There is a cable car that allows you to go up over the tell, which you see here in the circle. This is the mound where the ancient city is found, and quite a bit of excavation can be seen from the air. Uh, not too many people riding the cable car nowadays. This is the Hamas headquarters. <laughs> they haven't quite got the knack of promoting tourism there, at shooting everybody. Uh, but after Garstang had done his work, uh, Kathleen Kenyon took over. She's one of the ones who we're told has modernized archaeology in Israel. And she says the city belonged to a much earlier time and could not be biblical Jericho based on the absence of the imported Cypriot ware pottery. This is special pottery from Cyprus. That should be there if this is Joshua's time. And there's some fairly reasonable conclusions uh, regarding that. She dug and she didn't find it. And so she concluded it couldn't be Joshua's Jericho. She did acknowledge that things were burnt and the walls had fallen. The lack of pottery proved that it could not be Joshua's Jericho. And then she died. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, we'll have more to say about her later. Bryant Wood began to work there in the late 90s and after the turn of the century and found exactly what she said would indicate that it was Joshua's Jericho, but she says it wasn't there. He found that it was. This is expensive pottery. She was digging in the poor part of the city. He said you ought to look in the prosperous part, and he found lots of it. And we, by the way, do have an excellent example of that Cypriot pottery back in the museum, the artifact room, that you can examine. But not only did he find the pottery that she said would indicate Joshua's Jericho, he found a continuous series of Egyptian scarabs with dated inscriptions. I mean, how do you nail it down any better? An unbroken series extended from the 18th century B.C., way before the Exodus, up to the time of the conquest where it stops. An unbroken series right up to the time of the conquest and it's over. There's no way to establish it any better than that. He found a number of things, some of which Kenyon had found, uh, the remains of a fortified tower, storage containers that were had in indicated were full of grain at the time that it was burned. Normally, you wouldn't find that with a conquered city because grain is, is a commodity much like uh, our money today. And so the people that conquer it take the grain, but they didn't here. Well, we know they were to commanded not to take things from Jericho. And furthermore, in Joshua chapter 3, we're told that when they came across the Jordan, this was at the time of the harvest, 
And so the storage containers would be full, and they would leave them full, and then the burned city is piled on top of it. Again, confirming what we find. He found the retrievement wall at the base of the tell that had reinforced it. He found the fallen brick outside that retrievement wall uh, that formed basically a ramp going up toward the city. Uh, here are some of those fallen brick where we were just a few months ago. This is the diagram that Bryant Wood made showing the fallen brick uh, making virtually a ramp going up the retaining wall toward the tell and this is the way they conquered the city. One of the most amazing things that he found just <laughs> made chills go up and down my spine as I looked at it. There was one portion of the wall that was still remaining. The whole wall didn't fall. There was one, you remember there was a promise that was made to one whose house was on the wall that it would be preserved. And we look at that one portion that is left, and we see the house. I think I know who lived there. Joshua chapter 2, she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. And she was promised that her house would be preserved. The only portion that's left. Well, I find that thrilling. We move from there to consider the story of the prophet Balaam. This has been one of the favorite objects of ridicule of the atheist. After all, he's got a talking donkey. Who in the world can believe that? And of course, that story is preserved for us in Numbers. He was working with the Moabites, the Ammonites, the enemies of the children of Israel as <clears throat> at the time of the exodus they were marching toward the promised land and uh, were mowing down the people one after another and we see what they did to this group and to that group and the Moabites were afraid they would be conquered and so they hired him a prophet to curse the children of Israel. Uh, Balaam. At Tel Der Allah, and the, the Tel is, is a term for the mounds on which the cities were built. Usually they had been destroyed several times and the mound uh, was the accumulation of the destruction. They'd build the next city on top of it and we find that all over Israel and in the, the, the area. But here is the Tel, Tel Der Allah. This is on the other side of the Jordan as the Jabbok River meets the Jordan. And that was excavated just a few years ago. And in this Tel, they found what was actually an administration building for the Amorites. This is not the Israelites. This is the enemies of the Israelites. And it was covered with plaster that had fallen off. But on that plaster, they had written various stories. Uh, and down at the, the base of the wall, you see the broken plaster that they then could put together, written on with black and red ink. And so, like a jigsaw puzzle, they put this back together to see what the Amorites had to say. And there were a number of administrative details that they had, but as they put that together, they found, of all things, the story of Balaam the prophet. Again, not written by the Israelites, but by the enemies. And here is one line which says, Warnings given by Balaam the son of Behor, a seer of the gods. Now this is from the 8th century B.C. A story of Balaam the prophet by the enemies of God. Numbers 22 says, So he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Behor, at Prethor, which is near the river. They saw what Israel had done to the Amorites. <laughs> and here's what the Amorites had to say about it. And of course we continue reading the latter part of the verse. Behold, a people came out of Egypt. This relates directly to the Exodus, which the archaeologists deny today. And, of course, relates to what we read in verse 28, the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. A crazy story? Well, we have archaeological confirmation of that story and of that prophet from the enemies of the children of Israel. I think that's awesome. This material is now on display in Armand, Jordan, uh, and you can go there and look at it.
in the museum. Shiloh is the way it's referred to uh, by most of the Israelis. Joshua chapter 18 verse 1 says, The whole congregation of the sons of Israel assembled themselves at Shiloh and set up the tent of the meeting there. This was the first permanent place for the Ark of the Covenant during the period of the Judges. And it stayed there for several hundred years. Uh, there, as you read further, you see pretty specific instructions uh, about where this was. And so you can get, obviously, very close. And we found a church in the area that was built about 400 years after the time of Christ, the Byzantine period, to commemorate Shiloh, the place where they had parked the tabernacle, if you please. And the floor, a beautiful mosaic floor, happened to match the dimensions of the tabernacle, and so it was thought that this was the spot that had been chosen 400 years after Christ, long after, of course, the actual event, that was on the spot where the tabernacle was. Well, uh, that's not really the case. Uh, just recently, with further excavation on the tell, the northern part of that tell, they found that this was just to... Yes, commemorate the spot, but not built on the spot. This is the gate that they found and that uh, opens the way to the path that leads up to the plateau where the tabernacle actually was. And it's so well confirmed that even the Department of Antiquities there in Israel has put up the plaque saying this in all probability is where the tabernacle stood. Up on that plateau that's been newly excavated, we have this stone wall, which was the base. Now, you can't really get the dimensions in this picture. We'll get more in, in just a moment. But the thing that really nailed this down was they found 4th century B.C. inscriptions. Now, this is 800 years earlier than this Byzantine church that clearly identified this as Shiloh. Now, it didn't really say, welcome to Shiloh, but it was pretty close. <laughs> 400 years before the time of Christ. And as we look at the outline here in stone, we see where the tent poles were, the holes in regular intervals that go right on around and uh, were to support the, the tent, the tabernacle. Looking at this picture, you really need to be 50 feet in the air, which was kind of hard for me to do. But with the line here, you can see the dimensions of the tabernacle, which fit beautifully. This is where the tabernacle was for well over 300 years, and where they worshipped during the period of the Judges. This was the, the capital of Israel during that period, if you please. This is where the sacrifices and the annual feasts took place, where the land was allotted to the tribes, where Eli judged and Hannah prayed, and Samuel served, and where Eli fell and died. Actually, it wasn't here at this spot. The text says that when he heard the story of the capture of the ark and of the loss of the battle and the death of his sons, he was at the gate. Well, we found the gate, you recall, that leads to this place. This is where he would have been sitting and where he fell and died. From all of the evidence, it's convincing even the skeptics. One after another, we're found, this is all, this, the inscriptions were found in the last six months, so it's just almost every month we're finding new confirmation. The fortified gates of Solomon have been known for half a dozen years, but they're interesting confirmation of what we read in 1 Kings chapter 9. This is the account of the forced labor which King Solomon levied to build the house of the Lord, his own house, the Milo, this is at Jerusalem, and then also he built at Hazer and Megiddo and Gezer. Well, of course, Solomon is this fictitious creature like Zeus that uh, you know, the real scholars don't believe in. But what did he do at Hazer and Megiddo and Gezer? Well, you go there and you find these strange-looking gates that guard the city, very <laughs> difficult to break through these gates into the city with this kind of fortification. And the places where you find these gates are at Hazer and Megiddo and Gezer. <laughs> and the pottery that we find associated with the gates is from the time of Solomon.
Isn't that a surprise? I think that's exactly what the text describes. That's where Solomon built. One of the most exciting bits of evidence was found a number of years ago, but brand new evidence has been uncovered within the last two years. It involved two silver amulets from the 7th century B.C. They were found in Jerusalem at the place now occupied by St. Andrew's Scottish Presbyterian Church, just south of Old Jerusalem. The, find, the first find was made in 1979. Gordon Franz was the supervisor of this dig, actually under the guidance of the director of Gordon Barke, uh, who wasn't there when the actual find took place. Judith Hadley is the one who actually found the, the silver amulet. She was a grad student at Wheaton, and she's now a professor at Villanova. But one of her colleagues is laying here in what was a tomb. It's a collapsed tomb. It was over him at the time this was originally built. And under where he's laying is a storage area with a number of pots, pottery, uh, various artifacts. And it was in the corner, as Barclay is indicating in the inset there, that this amazing find was made. Silver amulets that were rolled up, but they had inscriptions on them from the Bible. This is from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you, and make the Lord make his face to shine upon you. The priestly blessing was what they, the priest wore around their neck. They inscribed this on the pieces of silver, rolled it up, and wore it as an amulet. This is from Jeremiah's time, clearly identified from the pottery, as well as from other cultural implications and really not even contested by the liberals. Well, how did they inscribe so, so well on silver? In fact, we found with infrared technology in the last two years much more than what they originally found. <clears throat> Numbers 6, 24, uh, 25, and 26 were very obvious. As we developed more technology, reported in the New York Times, by the way, just two years ago, Almost the whole chapter uh, of the context is engraved on the back of it. How did they do that? I think we get a hint from Jeremiah 17, where we read, uh, The sin of Judah is written down with an iron stylus with a diamond point. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart. Evidently, they were doing some engraving with diamonds at the end of an iron stylus. And so on this, you do have the text. Now, the significance we related to this morning when we're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, the documentary hypothesis says these books that comprise the earliest books supposedly written by uh, Moses, the early writers, weren't, weren't written then at all, but written after the captivity. Uh, and this is what the documentary hypothesis is supposed to have proved. And we found then some of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were actual copies of the Paleo-Hebrew, which had to have been written prior to the exile, because that's the only time that style was used. Now, when they found the, the 300 B.C. copies, uh, it wasn't from before the exile, but there were copies of what was before the exile. This was not a copy. This was written before the exile. This was 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it is precisely like the text that we have today. Identical. <clears throat> Two renditions of it and almost a whole chapter on the back side. 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. That just says the people that have given their faith the documentary hypothesis have made fools out of themselves as they tried to deny the Word of God. We moved to Tel Dan. This is up at the northern end of Israel. Uh, we can see Mount Hermon in the background. Uh, this is the northern extremity of Israel, and there we find Dan. You remember when uh, the, the kingdom split? And you've got Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam took the ten tribes to the north, and he set up at Dan uh, and at Bethel, altars, to keep them from going back to Jerusalem. Well, even the Department of Antiquities now have recognized that 
they have found that altar at Dan, and they have their signs put up that commemorates Jeroboam's altar at Tel Dan. This is a picture of that restored. The, the metal part has been restored, but they have found with the utensils uh, clear indications that that's what that is. This is uh, Dr. Clifford Wilson, who was head of excavations at Gazer for a number of years, a very strong believer in the Word of God. The utensils that they found that were used by the priests to offer the sacrifices are now in the museum there in Jerusalem. This was one of two altars, you remember, at Dan and at Bethel. Well, the altar at Bethel was destroyed, wasn't it, by the curse. Remember the young prophet and the old prophet in that story, and he cursed the altar, and it split. This one didn't, <laughs> and this one we have found. On the southern side of the city of Dan that has been excavated over a number of years, we see the gate to the city. In a number of places in the Old Testament, you read that they sat at the gates, and this is where judgment was rendered. You remember Job sat at the gates of the city, and others uh, had judgment rendered there. This is a scene that gives insight into that. Here's where the judge sat, the elders sat beside him. Now these uh, wooden poles, of course, have been restored, but they fit into the sockets that were there, and they were for the wooden poles, and looked just like this. Just outside that gate, another excavation took place in 1993. Here's the, where the gate was that we just looked at. Just outside an inscription that formed a steel. This is an upright stone with writing on it, commemorating some historical event, typically. It was found in 1993 by an official Providence dig. One of the objections the archaeological people make if you find something that they don't like, well, it's not a Providence dig. It wasn't under the authority of the Department of Antiquities. And most of the great finds, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, weren't found in that manner. But this was, this was by one of the leading archaeologists in Israel, a Providence dig under the, uh, the auspices of the Department of Antiquities. And it describes a battle between Hazel, king of Aram, and the kings of Judah and Israel. Again, this was written by the enemies, by the one who actually defeated Israel, and basically it's saying, I just whipped them bad. You know, I destroyed the house of David. Now, one of the statements that you find commonly in the standard textbooks is there's no reference to David, there's no archaeological evidence for this great kingdom, and we'll see some of that in a minute. And it's not so. And here is absolute proof that there was a house of David, that this claim that they never existed is just dishonest because it has been archaeologically confirmed again by the enemies of God. One of the area supervisors at the city of David now for about four years and working with some, some very brave men. The city of David, we often think, refers to Bethlehem, and uh, there is a sense in which that can be called the city of David, but that's a term that was used by David to refer to the city that he conquered from the Jebusites, that was Jerusalem. 1 Samuel 5 tells us the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. The inhabitants of the land, they said to David, you'll not come in here, but the blind, the lame will turn you away, thinking David cannot enter here. It was a highly fortified city. This is long after they conquered the land, took possession of it, lived in it. This is uh, about the last thing that was done. Back all the way to David's time, this was a strong fortification that hadn't been conquered. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And we continue to read how that happened. Verse 8, David said on that day, whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft, and defeats the Jebusites, the lame, blind, hated by David's soul. He shall be chief and captain. So as we read the story, we find that Joab was one who was brave enough to go up the water shaft and got inside the city, opened the gates, and said, Okay, fellows, come on in. And they marched in and took the city. Verse 9 says, So David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. 
And David built all around from the Milo inward. This Milo, we didn't know what that was. I think we've got a pretty good idea at this point. David became greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. And then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David with cedar trees and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a house for David. Okay, here's this great king with these great monuments that were built, monumental buildings, and he became greater and greater. Where's the evidence? Well, there's sort of a catch-22 here. What happened? The Babylonians came in and destroyed it, didn't they? And what happens to cedar when you set fire to it? It burns. And if you were find, to find this house of David built of cedar and, of course, stone as well, then you'd know the story was false. But you don't find it. They say, well, see, it's false. <laughs> but you should find evidence and foundations and indications that it was there, and indeed we do. But let's look at some historical background to the contest here over the city of David and begin with Kathleen Kenyon again. She was, uh, of course, from Oxford and is noted for modernized archaeology in Israel. That means she got people to disbelieve the Bible. She worked in Jericho from 52 to 58, as we've indicated, and spent time then uh, after she finished in Jericho at the city of David from 61 to 68. And here is her conclusion. It may seem disappointing that the excavations have discovered none of the buildings of David's city. Virtually no area remains in which there's any hope of the finds of the period. The whole of this area must therefore be written off as far as any knowledge of early Jerusalem is concerned. But just forget about it. There's nothing here. Go away. Don't even look. I've looked, and it's over. And a lot of people were influenced by that. She died, uh, and then Yigil Shilo took over the excavations at the city of David and did a very courageous job. Now, he became sick uh, and died an early death. He excavated from 78 to 85, and died before his finds were published, but he refuted Kenyon's work, just step by step. He's a, a very courageous person. Jane Cahill is in the process of publishing his work, and I have received copies of the original work, and uh, it is in the process of being published. In the meantime, uh, since he died, the digs there in the city of David have been taken over by Ronnie Rach and Ellie Sukron, who is my supervisor, one that we've worked with there for a number of years. And these, I think, are very brave men exposing the truth under fierce opposition. Now, Ronnie Rach is more of the politician. He doesn't come out as brashly as Ellie Sukron does, who just tells it like it is <laughs> and has gotten in some trouble, but nevertheless are fighting for the truth. On the other side, opposing what they're doing are men like Israel Finkelstein of Tel Aviv University. He's director of the Institute of Archaeology. And I think you need to know what's being said in opposition to get the context of these investigations. He says, and this was in 2003, almost no signs of monumental building operations. The mythical united monarchy is a literary construct. And from the way he's standing there, you can get an idea where he's coming from. And that's not an illusion. That's <laughs> he's not a Bible believer, obviously. In fact, he was lecturing here in the United States recently, and his seminar was entitled, What? No Moses? And, of course, that's what he was contending for. His colleague, David Yashiskin, there at Tel Aviv University, made this comment in the same publication. I'm afraid the evidence regarding the magnificent Solomonic capital was not discovered because it is non-existent, not because it's still hidden in the ground. Now, that's in Israel where they have some opposition, and there's, <laughs> that may sound like wild and reckless, but you haven't seen wild and reckless till you get over into Europe where they build on that and just really exaggerate. Here's uh, Niles Peter Lamech the University of Copenhagen. Archaeological data have now definitely confirmed that the empire of David and Solomon never existed. Now, how does archaeological data confirm that something never existed? <laughs> You could confirm something did exist, but maybe you find something tomorrow that 
confirms it that you haven't found today. And so, anyway, that's, that's another story. Jane Cahill, the successor, uh, at least publisher, of Shiloh's material, is uh, likewise a courageous individual who's fighting back. And in Biblical Archaeological Review 2004, she says, the most frequently voiced argument by those who challenge the historical existence of the United Monarchy is a supposed, and I'd underscore supposed, lack of archaeological evidence. Now, you don't find the Palace of David with all the cedar planks in this huge structure, monumental buildings that were destroyed by Babylonians and by Romans, but still it's appropriate to say it is a supposed lack of evidence. In most cases she continues saying these arguments are either grossly misleading, illogical, disingenuous, or all three. Now you might think, well, she's a little over the top here in her response, but let's look at the evidence first before you make that judgment and see if that kind of a statement is just a fact. What's the evidence for this city of David? We're looking here at the Temple Mount and the triangular area just south of the Temple Mount was the area that was occupied by the Jebusites and that's referred to as the city of David. The earliest reference to this city is from the Armana letters that date back to the 14th century BC. This is considerably, I believe, before the Exodus. And here is a letter from the ruler of Jerusalem to the Egyptian pharaoh. And in the inset here, the white uh, boxed letters, you see reference to Jerusalem before the Exodus. After, of course, the Exodus, after David and his people arrived, then we likewise see evidence. This is the way uh, it has been reconstructed. This is the way they believe it appeared at the time David arrived on the scene. We see the irrigation system over on the, the right-hand side, I think the Pool of Siloam down at the bottom. Up at the top we see the temple that was ultimately built by Solomon and uh, David's palace there below that. The, th the thing that came under first investigation uh, by Cahill and by others was the area that's referred to as the stepped structure that the era is pointing to. Obviously something is going on here. Cahill tried to say it was built by numbers of different people over hundreds of years. Shiloh refuted that by sinking the square shaft that you see up at the top and with that shaft showed that the whole thing was interconnected and interdependent and had to be built at the same time not over long periods, but was built by the Jebusites and was there at the time David arrived. On the foot of this sloping stepped structure, which is the foundation of obviously something that had to be really big, what needs that kind of a foundation? It's been estimated maybe a six-story building. I mean, you wouldn't need that much foundation without it. On the foot, you see later buildings and this dates back to the end of the first temple period, just before the Babylonians marched in. And especially in, in one of these structures on the foot, the later structures, you have what's referred to as the archive building, for good reason. Important papers were kept here. Well, the papers were burned. They're not available to us. But the papers were sealed with a clay seal stamped by a signet ring or by a stamp of the official that was sending this important document. And this is where a number of them were stored because you find a lot of the seals. And when it's burned, actually the fire uh, fires the clay and helps preserve it. Fifty-one of these stamps, referred to as bully, have been found from this archive building that dates to the time at the end of the first temple period, right at the time when the Babylonians came in and burned it. As we pointed out, these seals are often used to date things, and you see the, the thing that did the impressing on the left-hand side and the stamped clay that's been fired on the right-hand side. Fifty-one of these were found, and as they began to look and read what they said, it was astounding. Here's one from Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, that's mentioned in 1 Chronicles 9. This was a member of the family of high priests who officiated at the end of the first temple period. 
Then we read of Jeremiah, the son of Shapan. He's one of the scribes, a high official in the court of Jehoiakim, who was the king at the time that the Babylonians came marching in, reigned at the end of the first temple period. Then Baruch, mentioned in the same verse, if you're familiar with Jeremiah, this was his scribe. He's mentioned some 26 times by Jeremiah, and we have two of Baruch's seals. Actually, one of them has his thumbprint in the back of it. This uh, rather liberal, I'd say (laughs) semi-liberal, archaeology book published in 98, Archaeology in the Old Testament, says this lump of clay used to close a papyrus document was sealed by none other than Baruch, the son of Neriah, specifying here Jeremiah 36 and 4. Then the king's son, who gave the orders to seize Jeremiah, to throw him into the pit, Jeremiah, his seal. I mean, these were the kinds of people that would have documents with their stamp on them, and that's what we find in this archive building. Uh, The king's son is there. Actually, of the 51 bully that were found, they attest to 26 mentioned in the Bible. 26 out of the 51 you have reference to. And, of course, the Bible would be describing the officials of the court. And, uh, wow, how do you get greater, more obvious confirmation that the Bible knows what it's talking about when it describes these people? Let's move back in history to the water shaft that's mentioned that Joab went up to conquer the city. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5. He, whoever goes up, climbs up by the way of the water shaft, defeats the Jebusite. There's been a lot of questions about this and some things that were proposed as the water shaft that, that really weren't. But there was an irrigation system, a spring, we'll look at that in just a moment, in, in, in the city of Jerusalem. And water from that spring ran down the outside edge, and then there were holes that allowed the water to go out into the fields to irrigate. Well, Joab went through one of those holes, came up that water shaft, and then into the city. Today, you can walk right down that water shaft, as my wife is doing here. And uh, if you travel over there, this is one of the things you want to do, just like Joab did. The water comes from the Gihon Springs, which is, of course, mentioned numerous times in the Bible. It provides water for the city of Jerusalem, one of the few sources of water in Israel. And it's a very prolific spring. Mentioned in 2 Chronicles 32, it was Hezekiah who stopped the upper outlet of the waters of the Gihon and directed it to the west side of the city. They, of course, now occupy the city, and here comes Sennacherib, ready to attack the city, the Assyrian king. And, okay, maybe they're going to come up the water shaft like Joab did. So we've got to protect this. And he did so with an outer wall and by redirecting the water back to the western side of the city. Well, you look there at the spring and you can see the shaft that was cut where it's pointed toward the west side of the city. And we'll see where that shaft goes in just a moment. But there at Gihon, there was a tower that was surrounding it that formed a a large area where Solomon was coronated. And we look to 1 Kings chapter 1. The king said, this is King David, take with you the servants of the Lord, have my son Solomon ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon, where the springs are. Let Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet anoint him. They blow the trumpet. Here's a big ceremony they're going to have. And it would be in this restored area in the center of this area pointed to by the era. That's where the spring is, and these towers were built around it to protect the spring. Well, they're not really towers. There's really just one tower we have found out now since this picture was drawn. Where is this area where the coronation took place? There was a little room, about 8 by 12, that the archaeologist said this, this is all it could be. David Alid is one of the archaeologists who's working there with us in the city of David, was listening to one of the tour guides say this and thinking about what he read in Scripture. There were mules in here. (laughs) There was the prophets. There was a big ceremony. In this little room, this just doesn't make any sense. And he just kind of went berserk, they thought, grabbed up a sledgehammer and started beating on a wall. He says, there has to be more than this. 
And the wall was actually built that he was beating on by Queen Helena some 300 years after Christ. She's the mother of Constantine that made a lot of messes over there. He broke the wall down and it opened up into this huge area, not quite as big as this auditorium, but close. Certainly room for several mules in the ceremony that they're talking about, uh, as would be reflected in the area that you're looking at here. That's inside that area. There at the spring of Gihon. Water was also stored from the spring at a pool that we have determined dates back to the time of Melchizedek. But at the time Sennacherib came, they decided to fill it in because this, is, uh, this was to protect the water from anyone who would be coming, and that's uh, militarily significant. We were involved in helping to excavate that pool, which had been filled in by King Hezekiah, and you see all kinds of pottery and artifacts, idols, from the time of Hezekiah. And uh, at this point, we see uh, my son in the center, and then a broken idol that he found uh, at the excavation there. There are several of them have been, every one of the idols that have been found were broken. None of, many of the jars are intact, many of the oil lamps are intact, but all of the idols are. Well, Hezekiah didn't get along well with the idolaters, did he? He helped destroy, bring down, break down the idols, and he broke the idols before he piled them into the pool. This is the south end of a northbound calf, uh, which they typically worshipped. The text says he diverted the water to the west side of the city, and we saw the little outlet there from the, the spring that headed to the west side. Again, Second Chronicles 32, he stopped the waters of Gihon, directed them to the west side, and made the pool and the conduit, brought the water into the city. This is a diagram of what we're looking at. Here's the Gihon spring there in red, and the dark blue line is the tunnel that Hezekiah dug to redirect the water from the original course indicated by the light blue line, which he then protected by an outer wall, as we'll see. But the water then went down this dark blue line. It was through a tunnel that he dug. Well, you can walk down those tunnels that are described in Scripture as being built by Hezekiah, and there's an inscription that was found several years ago that described how the tunnel was built this is a picture of it. It describes beginning from either end, and as they approached, they could hear each other, and they finally met as Acts was against Acts. It gives the length of the tunnel. It's there, just like the scriptures would indicate and as confirmed by the inscription. That tunnel continued down to the pool of Siloam, the text says in Scripture, well, here's this little bitty pool that the tunnel goes to. Now, that was a puzzle because the Pool of Siloam ought to be more significant than this, and it's just a little dinky thing that you can see here in this picture that the tunnel does go to, and the Scripture says, okay, it goes to the tunnel, but this is not much of a pool, and actually what's built around it is Byzantine. It's not uh, really that old. What we found was that that's not the Pool of Siloam. This blue, light blue area, lower, is a much larger pool. It's uh, well over an acre that we found in 2004. But wait a minute, the, the tunnel doesn't go down to the big pool. Well, yes, it does. <laughs> we found out last year, last summer, as we helped excavate, the, the tunnel just kept right on going past that little bitty dinky thing that they've been saying is the Pool of Siloam for years to the big pool. Let's go back up to the Gihon Springs where there were towers built around to provide it. And that tower, I think, is referred to in Scripture in Luke chapter 13, but it's pointed to here by the era. And remember Jesus said, do you suppose these 18 on whom the tower fell and killed were worse culprits than all the men in it? 18 people were killed here. And sure enough, we found where that tower had fallen and these huge stones that were probably laid there by the, the, the Jebusites had fallen, and uh, that was what had been protecting. Uh, this is where 18 people were killed, and uh, actually we got a 19th. Uh, no, that's actually my son here posing as one of the 19th. Uh, he found the... Uh, the vertebrae here of a donkey right next to the tower as we were excavating and came up with the theory that maybe the donkey kicked the tower over 
I don't think so, but <laughs> we're enjoying ourselves as we're uh, excavating in this area. The wall of Hezekiah is a very impressive find found by Eli Sukron. Again, back in Second Chronicles 32, Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come, intended to make war on Jerusalem. He took courage, rebuilt all the wall that had been broken down, erected towers on it, and built another outside wall. So in addition to redirecting the water to the west side, he built an outside wall that we see here, protecting what Joab had climbed up through. And here it is. Kenyon referred to this specifically, said it didn't exist. There's no wall. If there was a wall, I would have found it. Well, if she had been a good, if she'd been looking for it, I think she'd have found it. Obvious, I mean, this is hard to miss. This is huge. But when you're not looking for it and don't believe it's there, then it's easy to miss. And she did, but it's, uh, it's obviously there, just as described in Scripture. On the west side, the far extremity, there were, there's a description of the wall that was built when Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls in uh, chapter 2, verse 17. He rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. Verse uh, 8 of chapter 3 says they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. This is as far as in the western direction goes. Well, you go to the western side and you look at the wall and there it is and it's 23 feet across. That's the broadest part of that rebuilt wall, and uh, that's exactly the way it's described. The tombs of the house of David were one of the things Kenyon referred to and said there's no reference to the tomb. And First Kings 2 says that David slept with his fathers, was buried. Well, if you find some of the tombs of the prophets, and there are several there, you ought to certainly find where David was buried. Well, we did. <laughs> uh, it was difficult because Queen Helena had made this her quarry, and I think it was a beautiful edifice initially, several indications of that, but you see where the, the square areas are. She's quarrying stones here to build her buildings and had destroyed this, but even the liberals now acknowledge, yes, this is David's and Solomon's tombs and they were probably beautiful before Queen Helena destroyed them. The walls that surrounded the temple, a few portions of that do remain. Remember, of course, the story of the Romans marching in, destroying Herod's temple, and a portion of the retaining wall, not the temple, but the retaining wall is seen here in what's referred to often as the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. The upper portion that you can just barely see, the smaller stones, was built by the Crusaders. The midsection was done by Hadrian, but the lower section, the much bigger, more elaborate stones were laid down by Herod, and actually they continue about 30 feet below the street level there. You can't see all of it, but here are some of those large stones that Herod built, and you can see the bosses around the edges. The southern extremity of that same wall was excavated about 15 years ago, and it's really interesting. Again, you see the small stones up top that were done by the Crusaders, and then at the base, Herod's Wall. But notice this structure here in the side. It probably looked like this. In fact, there's real good indication that it did. It's referred to as Robinson's Arch. He ac excavated and found this a, a good while back, uh, about 100 years ago, uh, though they had not excavated below that. But this is where that arch connected and led to shops, the first century shops that are down here in the foreground, the arched over a first century street. But all of uh, where, where the Crusaders have built here, there were huge buildings, very elaborate buildings, that came tumbling down when the Romans destroyed this. Again, not the temple walls, but here the retaining wall around the temple. And what we see at the base of that wall then is where those huge stones hit that first century street and just pummeled it, destroyed it, uh, which is exactly what we read about in Scripture. So those walls, together with the fact they have fallen, all testifies to just exactly what we read about in Scripture. As we read the description of 
the Temple Mount and the Pool of Siloam and uh, this area of the city of David, we read of the stairs that go down to the pool. Nehemiah 3, when they're rebuilding it, spoke of the Pool of Siloam and the stairs that go down from the city of David. Well, about 10 years ago, a Bible-believing archaeologist excavated on the south side where they would be going down and found the stairs that go down, according to the scriptures, to the Pool of Siloam. Now, it's about half a mile down there, and so we haven't got all of them, but they began looking at these stairs. Now, these would be significant. These are the stairs Jesus stood on. These are the stairs the apostles stood on. Right here is the gate beautiful, the edifice built into it, covering it up, built by, guess who? <laughs> Queen Helena, Constantine's mother, who made all kinds. Of, why did she build I'm not sure. I don't know. But she covered up the gate beautiful. But right below where that era is, is where uh, the lame man in Acts chapter 3 jumped up. And uh, that's where uh, Peter and John were preaching. As we turn to the right, we can see those stairs extending along the southern extent of the Temple Mount and toward Mount of Olives in the, the, the background. Uh, we're reminded of the statement that from the Temple to the Mount of Olives was a Sabbath day's journey. How long is that? Well, there it is. <laughs> you can see. And as you turn back around to the right again, you see down those stairs toward the city of David, actually a little bit more to the right. Going down those stairs, we have sunk shafts, and those stairs do continue all the way down to the Pool of Siloam, though we couldn't find them as we neared the pool. This is referred to in John 9, where Jesus told the blind man, go wash in the Pool of Siloam. As we suggested in 2004, we finally found the real pool, which is uh, this green area covered by the fig trees and the pomegranates owned by the Anglican Church who say, this is our fig tree grove and you can't have it. <laughs> uh, we're negotiating at this point. But in June of 2004, they were repairing a sewer pipe. And as they did, they found these steps going down. Eli Sukron immediately recognized this as the Pool of Siloam, though he was ridiculed by many. By November of that year, uh, when we were there, we took this picture. Obviously, much more had been excavated. And then by June of 2005, it looked like this. Now, we still don't have a permit. We have a permit to fix the sewer pipe, and so we're fixing the daylights out of that sewer pipe. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what we believe the pool looked like from some shafts that we have been able to to sink in, in various areas. You could have baptized 3,000 people there all at the same time. A magnificent pool. The Temple Mount is back to the left. This escarpment over here is blocking the way. And where are the stairs that go up to the Temple Mount? Well, there were stairs that we found over here, and they led to a plaza with a colonnade, and we thought, well, maybe they go this direction, and then they turn and go back to the north. The more we excavated, the more we realized that was not the case. But here is the, the extension, as we showed, that goes all the way down to the Pool of Siloam. We have been excavating there since 2004, and here's my wife working with Ronnie Rach here in the red shirt, one of the supervisors. And this is the way it looked this uh, past June obviously a huge pool, but where are the stairs? Well, this escarpment over here on the right is, is blocking the way, and we kept looking. Here's the description again from Nehemiah chapter 3. He repaired the wall by the pool of Siloam, the steps going down from the city of David. Well, uh, here we see one of the supervisors marching toward the area, and this arrow is pointing to what was found just a few months ago. There was an area in this escarpment that were just a little too symmetrical. It had been filled in with the debris from the destruction of Jerusalem, and it covered over this huge tunnel that went through the escarpment. And so you see the, the wooden stairs there just barely that lead right up to that area. And as we stepped through that, we saw, wow, there are the stairs that we've been looking at that go right on up 
to the Temple Mount. We learned more about that from Josephus, who describes these stairs and a tunnel that's underneath them. It was a sewage tunnel originally, but here we read news had reached him that many had earlier escaped from the sieges of Jerusalem and collect there. They were trying to get out of Jerusalem when siege was laid by the Romans. Arriving there at the spot, that is the Romans, they found these Jews who were in this tunnel down under the stairs, and he ordered the infantry to break down into the streets under the stairs, and you can see where the holes are broken there in this in the stairway, and they poured boiling oil down into the tunnel and killed 3,000 Jews, according to Josephus. Of course, many more killed in the siege, but this was one of the tragedies. We can go into that tunnel, we can see where they were, and here you see the stairs uh, above them and the tunnel below, and we have ex that has been extended in the last few months, and it gets much larger, about 10 feet high. Notice the statement by Eli Sukron, who's one of the directors there of the city of David. He says, many of the Jews tried to escape Jerusalem. When the Romans pursued them, they broke the flagstones, descended into the canals of the drainage system, hiding for days uh, at a time, as described by Josephus Flavius. You know what we discovered here in the tunnels? We found cooking vessels, pots with the remains of food inside, which Josephus, by the way, had mentioned. Stone vessels, other objects still preserved from that era. Our assumption is that these vessels were used by the Jews who were hiding there until they were caught by the Roman soldiers. Now, if you look in our artifact room, you'll see one of those pots that he refers to that the Jews were carrying with them when they were burned alive in the tunnel. A much larger portion has just been revealed and was announced September the 11th of this year. And so this is an ongoing saga, but we found it because we believe what the Bible said, and we're looking exactly where the Bible said it should be, and that's where we found it. Let me mention one more thing before we conclude this evening. This was announced in the New York Times in 2005. King David's palace is found. <laughs> the thing that Kenyon said is not there, don't look, just forget it. An Israeli archaeologist says she's uncovered in the East Jerusalem what may be the fabled palace of the biblical King David. King Tyre sent messengers to David with cedar trees, carpenters, stonemasons. They built a house for David. So King Tyre is, Tyre is the, the capital of Phoenicia, and he's building a house for David. Of course, he married his daughter. And so we would look for a Phoenician-style palace in the middle of Jerusalem, which would be you know, rather easy to identify, and that's exactly what Alot Mazar has found. She's with Hebrew University. It was her grandfather who found those steps on the southern part of the Temple Mount that uh, there beside the Gate Beautiful. Where is this monumental building? Well, <laughs> here is a monumental building that she found. It is huge. This is what was uncovered actually just uh, this picture was able to be taken this year, and that's just a part of it. It continues on the other side of the street. It's at least six stories high. And from this picture on the other side of the street where we were working this past summer, you can see the levels as it goes down and down and down. It is huge. Monumental is uh, <laughs> almost a trivial word by comparison, and it was a joy to be able to work there and to be able to help excavate this. You can get a little bit of idea of the work that's going on. Looking at the pottery, we found that this was clearly identified. Some of it pictured here in place as it was being uncovered is from the 10th century, which is definitely identifying it as the time of David. The location is seen just below the Temple Mount, as indicated here by this square. And notice her description of how she found it. And this is from the New York Times. Archaeology is technical, but you dig with a mind open to historical sources, and anything can help. I work with the Bible in one hand, the tools of excavation in the other, and try to consider everything. One of the main clues in finding David's palace, says Mazar, was surprisingly from the Bible itself. David, uh, 2 Samuel 5, 17, uh, heard about it, went down from his palace to the citadel. He knew where the citadel was. The palace has to be up above. 
And so she published in one of the technical journals, this is where the Bible says it ought to be. I need to raise some money. I want to go dig. This is a test of what the Bible says before anything was found. And that's where she dug, and she found it, just exactly as she had published that she should find it. Notice the way this is analyzed, I think, scientifically in one of the commentaries there from Jerusalem. We have a biblical text describing in detail the creation of a Phoenician-style palace by David high up on a particular mountain. You've got a particular mountain, you've got a Phoenician-style palace, we've got the text describing it. Around the end of the 11th, beginning of the 10th century, uh, before the current era. Then we have a grand structure of the Phoenician style dating from the same time on the summit of that very mountain located with the assistance of the text and previous archaeological discoveries. This was not stumbled upon, moreover, but carefully hypothesized, and the current dig was proposed as a test. The likelihood of this happening by chance is extremely small. And I think you just have to say amen. This is the way science should proceed. It did, and it's confirmed. Sorry, liberals, that's just the way it is. <laughs> so, let's summarize looking at the evidence of the stones. Begin with the altar of Joshua on Mount Ebal, the Gilgal stones from Jordan, the fallen walls of Jericho and Rahab's house, the Balaam inscription, the Shiloh Plateau, the fortified gates of Solomon, the Hebrew text from Jeremiah's time, the Jeroboam's altar at Dan, and the house of David inscription. And then we get to the city of David, and we see first the 14th century cuneiform tablets identifying it before the Exodus, the stronghold of Zion, uh, this stepped structure, the administration buildings built on the foot of it with 51 bully. Uh, 26 characters from Scripture identified, Joab's water shaft, the Gihon Spring, the coronation site found because he believed what the Bible said, the pool of Melchizedek, the tunnels of Hezekiah, the tower of Siloam that fell, Hezekiah's wall, huge wall, the rebuilt walls, the broad walls, the tombs of David and Solomon, the pool of Siloam, the stairs from the temple down to the pool and the palace of David, Monumental palace, almost 200 yards across and six stories high. Jane Cahill was telling the truth when she says there's a supposed lack of archaeological evidence. And she's not over the top when she says, in most cases, the arguments denying this are grossly misleading, illogical, disingenuous, or, as I would say, all three or to put it in Texas terms, they're just lying through their teeth when they say there is no evidence for the city of David. Grossly misleading, illogical, and disingenuous. We'll conclude with a statement again by Adam Zetrel. He's been surveying Manasseh now for 20 years, beginning as an atheist and winding up as a believer. He says, after years of research, however, I believe it's impossible to explore Israel's origins without the Bible. Again and again, we have seen the historical value of the Bible. Again and again, we've seen that an accurate memory has been preserved in its transmuted narratives, waiting to be unearthed and exposed, not just by imagined stories in the Sunday school lesson, but by archaeological fieldwork and critical mind work. This is uh, referring to his effort there in the Manasseh survey. The area is relevant in particular for the reliability of the early Bible. Nearly a thousand new sites. Now, this is what he's found in the 20 years of the survey, just in the Manasseh area. A thousand new sites that can be referenced in Scripture create a new archaeological reality which connects the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges to the territory where they have happened. Now, a thousand data points is pretty heavy. I mean, that's, how do you argue with that? That's just, I think, unanswerable, which is what he's saying. And so when we consider the actual evidence, apart from the political battles and the religious denials, uh, the evidence is just overwhelming. And we have exactly what Peter commands us 
to give, a ready defense, a reason for the hope that's in us that will stand and uh, will embarrass the opposition.